Okay. Thank you for coming along to Engineers Ireland's conference on engineering education, future skills, standards, and mobility. My name is Richard Manson. I'm the Deputy Registrar and Policy Officer here in Engineers Ireland. You'll see a bit of me throughout the day, I think jumping up and down, introducing speakers and so on. But right now, this morning, I'd like to just do some of the housekeeping and then pass you over to Marguerite Sears, the President of Engineers Ireland. So just before I begin proceedings, I'd just like to point out the fire exits. Uh, which are through the door that you came in and also on my left hand side here. While we don't expect a fire drill, but in the unlikely event of an emergency, you'll be escorted out the front of the building and will uh, rendezvous on the street outside. So the structure of today is that we'll have an initial session where we'll have the welcome by Marguerite Sayers, the opening address from William Bosang, and then we'll have a session that really sets the scene for the rest of the conference, that being the, the policy uh, context and the international context and engineering education. And later on in the day, we'll move on to getting into a bit more detail on engineering skills of the future and on Engineers Ireland's accreditation process for engineering education. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Marguerite Sayers. Marguerite is the President of Engineers Ireland for the 2018-2019 term, or sorry, 2019-2020 term. <laughs> She's a Chartered Engineer and Fellow of Engineers Ireland with over 20 years of experience in electrical engineering. She's ESB's Executive Director for Customer Solutions, leading the energy retail company Electric Ireland and responsible for ESB's telecoms, e-cars and smart energy services businesses. So I'd like you to welcome Marguerite Sayers. Good morning, everybody, and you're all very, very welcome here to Clyde Road this morning for this very important conference on a really important topic. Uh, I also really want to welcome everybody that's joining us on webcast with quite a few people, I think, that have uh, signed in to join today. So in very many places around the country and possibly even around the world, you're all very welcome uh, to join us here today as well. So uh, I suppose, okay, I know largely I'm speaking to the converted in the room when I say that, look, engineers are a really, really important profession in society and indeed have played a pivotal role in uh, developing virtually every facet of the modern world in which we live. And bearing that in mind then when we consider uh, the fact that the problems that we have in society now that engineers are tasked with solving or traditionally have solved, the fact that they're very, very different now to what they would have been 20 years ago or 10 years ago or even five years ago means that I think this is a really important conference and uh, very timely to consider how we might need to change the skills that our engineering graduates in particular uh, come out of college with um, in order to make sure that in future they can actually address the changed issues or from a business perspective as well, they're actually opportunities uh, so that they can deal with those and that they're best placed to be as effective as they can and to hit the ground running when they enter the, the, the workplace. And I suppose looking at that as well, for us more mature engineers, it's also important to think about embracing lifelong learning and the fact that the skill set that we came out of college with isn't necessarily what is most effective for us in our day jobs anymore. Most of us have changed an awful lot. Uh, since we left college and we need to continue to embrace that through continuous professional development and again that's a, a role that I think the institution here plays a big part in. So um, looking at that change in skill set is what today is about and also then looking at our future education, our uh, mobility and also maintaining the standards of engineering. All of those things are really, really important and core to uh, the institution here in Clyde Road. So uh, I think what we have to do is look at the whole spectrum of engineering education. So certainly looking at third level, that's probably fairly obvious, but also looking at our companies and talking to our employers about when people are placed from third level institutions and they're placed into companies, what is the level of experience, experience that they get there? What skill sets do they pick up? What do we want them to pick up? And uh, equally, uh, like I said, for, the, for people who are in their careers, what is it that they need to do? And it might require some level of retraining, and I'm sure all of that will get debated today. 
So um, from an Engineers Ireland perspective, uh, like I said, we would consider that we have a very strong role as the representative body uh, for the profession in Ireland to act maybe as a, a lightning rod or to, to gather up all the information because we do interact with a huge amount of employers and we get information from employers about what they would like to see uh, in the skill sets that we have from students the minute that they enter the workforce. So that is a role I think that we can play. Not that institutions aren't doing their own research, we, we know well that they are, but it is something Something that we can do that maybe adds to that, that actually helps um, maybe lubricate that communication channel and make sure that that information flow is happening. So uh, I suppose one thing is identifying the skill set uh, that people need, and I know there's going to be a lot of discussion about that today, and we've got absolutely excellent speakers and panellists that are going to give the benefit of their expertise and their experience in discussing that topic. But another facet of it is once we have that, um, obviously there needs to be investment then to make that happen, and I suppose that's a little bit trickier, particularly for third level institutions, where that investment in uh, developing our engineers and our engineering students is really, really critical. And the other uh, facet, I think, is, is looking at our pipeline of engineers. So uh, Richard, that you've just met, and did uh, what I consider to be a really interesting uh, document and piece of research earlier this year. It's an engineering 2019 document that I often, often quote from. And 94% of employers in Ireland are very concerned that there won't be adequate numbers of engineers, first of all, but engineers with the right skill set for them in order to allow them to maximize uh, the performance of their companies. So there's two facets to that. One is the pipeline, the adequate number of engineers. And again, that's something that the STEPS team play a big role in here. So looking at second level institutions and what it is that we can do in order to encourage students to who have a big interest, I think, in second level in science and engineering topics, how we can get them to adopt engineering as their profession and to choose to do it in third level. When I leave here today, I'm going to an event in uh, the convention center and there's 500 second level students who are really interested in the topics of uh, education, engineering, science, etc. But they don't always convert that. We don't always see them converting that into choices at third level. And that is a piece of work we have to continue to do. The other thing is in that research that Richard did, and also uh, we see it from companies like LinkedIn and we also see it from um, places like the, the World Economic Forum, the kind of skill set that uh, we're hearing about now is a bit different from what would be traditionally expected from engineers. So in the past, I suppose, there was an awful lot of focus on the hard, hard engineering skills, and that's still there, but people kind of take technical knowledge now as read, and what's become increasingly important uh, back in the information we're getting from employers is what they really value now is certainly communication, that people's communication skills are really key, the ability to work in teams, and also uh, things like attitude, which I have to say as uh, an employer or manager in a company, you know, you can't overstate the importance of attitude and people's willingness to be enthusiastic and also to motivate other people. So all of those things, but particularly for engineers, that ability to have, um, you know, to take on really complex problem solving and to have that critical analysis and critical thinking, that's what employers are looking for now. And I, again, I suppose one of the things that uh, I've heard a couple of times from students is, you know, with artificial intelligence, are we not in danger of engineering our way out of a profession that we kind of end up replacing ourselves with machines and robots? But a piece of uh, research that was done by Oxford University says it's only about less than 2% of a chance that engineers would be replaced by robots. And with apologies to people from a financial background, I don't think William, it applies to economics, but uh, with apologies to people from a financial background, um, I think about 94 Four percent of accountants are expected to be replaced by uh, robots. Now, I think that's a bit unfair, to be honest, but I'm still looking forward to going back to the office and quoting it at a few of my colleagues. Uh, so, so um, look, I hope that you have a really, really engaging today, day today. Uh, like I said, we have a fantastic array of speakers. I really want to thank them. Some of them have traveled long, long distances uh, to be here, um, but even those who haven't are giving of their time today to, to discuss this topic, which will, I think, be a benefit to all of us, and particularly the workshop in the evening where we'll get a chance uh, to discuss uh, some of uh, the topics and, and uh, you know, get a level of additional research that we can apply here in the institution. So with that, I'm now going to hand you over to your first speaker of the day, 
Uh, it is uh, William Bozang, who's from the Department of Education and Skills, and William is actually the Assistant Secretary in the Department, and he has responsibility for higher and further education. He was uh, previously Assistant Secretary at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, so back to the money and the allocation of it, and uh, now had responsibility for expenditure policy and reporting and government reform. He holds a bachelor's degree in public administration and a master's in economic science, both from UCD, and completed also a graduate program in economics at the University of Tilburg. So please join me in welcoming William to the podium. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mark Rees. And I think some of the themes that you've mentioned, they just highlight the, the benefit and the value of a, a conference like this. It struck me as I was preparing. We talk a lot in the education sector about the importance of engagement because we feel that there's been a lot of progress made over the years in sort of putting in, in place in higher and further education a suite of programs through various organizations, through the institutions you represent that meet skill needs. But the big challenge all the time is engaging, and I know there's a lot of industry representatives here as well, and Marguerite has referenced the challenge, ensuring that the programs the pre people undertake, the skills that they come out of the education system with, are the skills that make them successful in the, in the workplace. And just that skills word, it, it's something on my mind, you start talking about skills and you're talking about higher education, everybody gets a bit of, you know, some people can say it's getting a bit reductionist as we talk about the role of education in society. So I saw a very in interesting way of sort of representing this issue recently, which talked about skills. So we talk about the umbrella term skills, but what are we talking about? We're talking about qualifications. That's a really important part of what the Engineers Ireland do. We're talking about the knowledge, the, the deep subject knowledge that uh, was referenced earlier, and we're talking about the workplace skills. And we're talking about then an approach to education, which ensures that people coming in out of the education system and then continuing their education in terms of lifelong learning. That's what they're building all the time. So I have responsibility for, uh, and I summarize a tertiary education in the, in the Department of uh, Education. And, and just in terms of the, my contribution and the discussion here, I suppose, our job is to provide the supports to enable the kind of work that the higher education institutions do, uh, further education colleges, what the education system does more generally, how industry uh, engages with the education sector to ensure that we're, we're meeting the skill needs, the education needs that are there, that we're building the human capital uh, that the, that's so central to where we got to as a, as a country, but also in terms of our long-term economic sustainability. So sometimes when you get into strategies, you get into policies, people sort of say, well, you know, it's, it can be, come across maybe as a bit technocratic, but I think when you see the suite of, of national strategies here, and I think it's important to emphasize that point about national strategies, the education sector, and I see it in the department, I'm in the department 18 months, there's a risk that we can be sometimes a bit inward facing, a bit uh, internally focused, rather than projecting out, first of all, the absolute criticality of what's done in education is important for the economy more generally, and that ties into the resourcing issue because we haven't been successful in terms of higher education in uh, making the case for a significant the kind of step change investment in higher education that's been argued for and that we need to build long-term economic sustainability. So I think we need to do some reflection ourselves on what are the, what are the supports, what are the pillars that we need to put in place as we look across the tertiary education system that, com that uh, creates that compelling uh, business case for investment. Um, Project Ireland 2040 I'd highlight as particularly important as we look at education strategy more generally by virtue of, the, of its focus on the importance of, of regional economic development and for, for, for those of you in, in, in any higher education institution, for those of you in institutions that are looking at acquiring technological university status, you'll be absolutely uh, aware and have a, a, a very strong understanding of the contribution that your, that your institutions currently make to your regions and can make, uh, can intensify into the future. So then you get into the detail of the frameworks that we operate uh, under in the department. And I, I draw attention in particular to the expert group on future funding, uh, just picking up on the point that was made uh, by, the, by the President in her, her opening uh, remarks, 
that argument that was made in Cassell's for creating a virtuous circle in looking at uh, the higher education sector in terms of increased investment been accompanied by uh, an education system that is evidently delivering high quality outcomes and that those outcomes are, verifi are verifiable. So that's the sort of the, the three pillars I think that we need to look at as we, as we reflect on the, the, the investment issue in, 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 in higher education. Um, moving on from that, and that's just the goals from our own uh, you know, statement of strategy, our own strategy statement in the department. So you'll, say, you'll see, just from uh, reviewing them quickly, that they're, they're all encompassing. They cover all of what we would seek to achieve through the higher education, through, through, uh, through tertiary education. I suppose the challenge then is to distill these, to refine these into actionable strategies and policies that deliver on the ground in terms of what society is looking for education to, to deliver. I suppose it's one thing talking about strategies and policies uh, when you look at what's actually on your desk what you're actually dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's probably a good way of communicating to people what the core priorities are. So I'll, I'll run through them uh, uh, quickly. I have one or two slides on them. Um, the piece of work that the European Commission are kicking off, it's a follow-on from the work that was done on the expert group and looking at the, the funding options that were identified by the Cassells. But more than that, it is looking, and it was something we were very keen to ensure that there, that we took this opportunity to ensure this piece of work could really contribute to moving the, the agenda forward on investment. So that whole issue of balance in tertiary education between higher education and further education is one that we, I think we need to look at very carefully. At the outset, those kind of distinctions sometimes aren't very helpful. I think they create a sense of a sector that's so segmented and has a tendency to operate in silos. Now you know from your own experiences, many you'll have many, very many experiences of where the two sectors work in a conjoint way, where where the learner moves from FET into higher education, where somebody who has benefited from higher education goes into FET for lifelong learning. But it is something that we're thinking about a lot in the department, how to present tertiary education in a more joined up way. And that balance issue in looking at our young people coming out of second level and asking the question, where is the best starting point for them to continue their educational journey? Huge progress, very good progress has been made in terms of new apprenticeships, but they're certainly not, I think it's fair to say, considered a mainstream option for a school leaver. So we clearly have a lot of work to do, and obviously the engineering profession has a lot of value added to bring to that discussion in terms of how we can make apprenticeship, apprenticeships work, uh, work better. The TU agenda is one that has really dominated, I think, in looking at the sort of the overall national strategic approach to higher education over the last decade. It's, I think, the, the, the original uh, higher education strategy in 2011, in 2011 highlighted the benefits of technological universities. And as you go back to the Hunt report, you'll find clearly all of the, uh, all of the benefits that you'd expect to use to to deliver, and that we're working to that we're working to ensure that they do. I think the difficulty is that we've spent a lot of time getting to a point where, at this stage, we have only at present one one technological university in the state. So I think, and it's reflected in our recent uh, in recent budgetary announcements and the creation of uh, a transformation fund, a ninety million three uh, a ninety million three year fund for investment in those institutions that are already TUs, but those that are, are working to acquire TU status. It's, we see it as a very important signal that progress in that area really has to be accelerated to realize the value that TUs can bring to their regions consistent with national, uh, with national objectives. And alongside the TU Transformation Fund, we'll be the Minister for Higher Education will be launching, I think next week, the report, uh, we call it the TURN report, it's the Technological University Research Network. It's an effort, I think, to really try to capture that, uh, as, we, as, we, as, as we're here towards the end of 2019, <laughs> facing into the next decade, what do we feel that technological universities can really deliver 
for the state, for their communities, for their regions. Uh, and there's a couple of really important themes that come through in terms of the importance of research, building research capacities in, our, in, in the institutions that, that it would be becoming to use. But also that whole set of issues around, and I mean, just to use the shorthand, because it's used a lot, Industry 4.0, but it's a sense that in the education sector, we're facing into very significant challenges in terms of a world of work that's been transformed by technology. And we need to reflect on a sect, how well that sector responds to those, to those challenges. Um, and there's a particular initiative, it was announced in last year's budget, but it's only kicking off, I think, uh, well, it's, it's kicking off, uh, it's been formally, formally launched in terms of um, at the Future Jobs Initiative next week. It's the Human Capital Initiative, and I think it's a very, I'll, I'll, I'll speak in the time remaining, <laughs> I'm conscious of time, I'll speak a little bit more about that, because I think it's a good example of the kind of initiative that demonstrates how the higher education system can be responsive to the challenges that are there in terms of skills, in terms of innovation, and in terms of uh, reform. And for somebody who's come into the sector over the last 18 months, and wouldn't have had a great line of sight into the way that the sector operates. It's clear that there's a huge amount of innovation, there's a huge amount of change, and there's a huge amount of reform. But the challenge is, it's not mainstreamed and it's not communicated. So I think as we look, coming back to the, the issue on the investment case, I think as we look at initiatives like human, the Human Capital Initiative and how that might play out over the next few, year or two, the, the, the challenge for us, the challenge for the sector, is to come to a point where we can be a lot more convincing and a lot more kind of evidence-based in our approach to how we describe how the, how the system, how, how the higher education system is meeting the, uh, the, the, the skill needs of the economy overall, not just in terms of what the skill requirements are as of today, but future-proofing graduates for a world of work that's going to be dramatically different to uh, you know, even how things how, how how things are when they when they take up their their first road or whatever. Um, the Human Capital Initiative, then, and I'll just uh, in the two or three minutes that are are are, are left to me because I'm conscious of time. Um, there's three elements to it. Now, two of them relate to a fairly conventional element of what we might do with increased funding as it becomes available to the uh, as it becomes available to the sector. The first element is essentially building on the springboard experience that a, a lot of you will be, we be familiar with, but moving to a point where we're funding the provision of full-time graduate conversion programs in priority skill areas. And those priority skill areas will be identified or are being identified through a very detailed process of engagement uh, drawing on the kind of labour market information that's there by, by generated by people like, uh, generated by organisations like Solus, but also by consulting widely with stakeholder groups. And it's really to try to help further embed that sense, and it's something that you will have from, from your own personal and professional experience, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, come across m very many times, but it's really to embed more generally the opportunities that are there for people to uh, who have a, a, an undergraduate degree, who are trained to uh, bachelor's level, the opportunity to retrain, reskill, upskill in, uh, in, in another area, and in that way uh, facilitate the kind of structural transformations in the economy that uh, Marguerite was talking about, uh, talking about earlier. So that's one for the accountants, I suppose, Marguerite. The other, um, the other element is very much focused on uh, existing higher education programs and the understanding that as we get a better line of sight into what the priority skills, skill needs are in the economy, uh, uh, it's just really ensuring that we have sufficient places to meet those needs. I think that the, the final pillar of the Human Capital Initiative, to my mind, is, 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 is really interesting, just going back to the points that I was making earlier on. It's a very focused attempt to encourage, a, um, a, a, encourage institutions as they look at existing programs under that pillar 3.1 to ascertain or to determine 
how they feel they could introduce a significant amount of innovation in the way that they, that they deliver particular programs. So, I mean, the kind of examples that we'd have in mind, but it's very much a, a kind of a, an, an open call, a, an open approach that we're adopting where we're asking the sector itself to come forward with, with its ideas. So, I mean, if you reflect on, let's say, a traditional civil engineering uh, course, the opportunity to look, for example, on flexible learning methods or kind of virtual learning uh, approaches to delivering that program in the future. And then that approach being uh, reversed back, reverse engineered back into existing programs and been mainstreamed to a much greater extent across the system. The final element then of or the second element of the third pillar, I know it sounds, it can sound a little bit complex, is really that future proofing objective that we have for the, for the uh, human capital initiative. Kind of looking at reform initiatives uh, to respond to future developments in work, technology and society. Uh, and the kind of emerging technologies that we all know and you know from your, from your professional experience are coming down the tracks, but that there is a, 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 a real challenge, I suppose, in seeking to determine what technologies will specifically win out. So what technologies do we need to equip our, our graduates with uh, or to, to, be, to be successful in, 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 in their career choices? But what trans alongside that, and, and going back to the point that was made earlier, what, using the kind of term transversal skills or essential skills, what workplace skills do our graduates need to ensure that whatever technologies emerge over that 5, 10, 20 year time horizon that they're in the workforce, that they're equipped to, to respond and to, uh, to adapt. So, I mean, the kind of examples that we have in mind, and just for, for the sake of examples, because I said it's very much a reaching out in the sector to ask the institutions themselves to reflect on these new agile approaches to higher education provision. But uh, just taking one example would be, let's say, a higher education institution developing a completely new course in an emerging technology. Another sort of facet of what we're looking for in the Haiti Human Capital Initiative, another example of what we might be looking at, is sort of an approach where you'd embed uh, entrepreneurship in learning outcomes on, let's say, all students on a, on a science course, or indeed introducing modules on things like artificial intelligence uh, in, a, in a computer science uh, program, an existing computer science program. Just to wrap up then, um, and I, the slides, I suppose we circulate and there is more, more information on them on some of the teams that I wanted to, some of the other teams I wanted to um, one of the th on the other themes that I wanted to, to, to cover. But it, it was interesting. I mean, we had a visit earlier this year from a, a gentleman called Tim Fowler, who is the head of the Tertiary Education Commission in, uh, in New Zealand. And um, so the Tertiary Education Commission is essentially would be the equivalent of SOLAS and HEA as a single institution here in Ireland. And just in, in talking to him, I, I sort of asked him, what sort of kept him awake at night in his role and hit with, with his responsibilities in the New Zealand, New Zealand system. And uh, he had some very interesting perspectives that I've just captured in that last slide and hopefully may, may feed into to, to discussions as we, as, as, as you, as we move, move through the morning. And it's really that sense, going back to that, just using that label, that Education 4.0 label that I referenced earlier, there is huge change uh, moving towards tertiary education. When you see those trends internationally, maybe not registering in a very strong way in Ireland yet, but you, I'm sure you've all come across the, the press coverage where people talk about how really kind of high profile employers aren't looking at degree level, at looking qualifications as the main measure of who they might want to recruit and how employable a person is. That shift from a kind of a focus in higher education on deep subject knowledge to those transversal and, and sort of our essential skills that people need in the workforce. Kind of boot camps, even in traditional uni universities, uh, you see it a lot or you see some examples of in the United States where universities are running short focused programs, maybe uh, generating kind of alternative credentials for the people who graduate from them which sort of attempts in a very specific way 
to identify that a particular individual has a particular capacity, a particular skill, a particular ability that really helps in terms of the matching in the labour market. And it's something I wanted to talk about. I, I won't have time to get into it in any detail. That whole issue of labour mark, labour market matching is really crucial as we look at trying to build productivity in the economy. It's probably the lowest hanging fruit that's available to us in trying to close the productivity gaps that we uh, uh, identify when we look across the economy as a whole. Thing, uh, so I suppose my, 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 my closing thought it really is to kind of reflect on that change coming towards higher education in the face of the challenges that you, that the people in the room here encounter in developing, designing, delivering courses, and then employers in terms of um, identifying employees that are going to support them in reaching the objectives and in, 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 in reaching objectives that they, they set for their, their organizations. It's really to reflect on what that then implies for what we should be looking to in terms of the future reform, future development, the future evolution of tertiary education. And also then finally bringing back to that whole set of issues around doing that in a way that makes the business case for increased investment uh, a much, much stronger proposition than it's proved to be uh, heretofore. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, William. And there's a huge amount of fodder there that I'm sure we'll come back to uh, later on. So uh, the next speaker, as William mentioned there, we just have one technological university that's up and running at the moment. So we're now going to hear from Professor Mike Murphy, who's the president of European Society for, the, uh, for Engineering Education. He's also a founding member of the European Engineering Dean's Council. Uh, he was academic registrar and director of academic affairs, digital and learning transformation, as I said, at the Technological University of Dublin. And he's also a chartered engineer and a, and a fellow of the institution here in Engineers Ireland. So you're very welcome to the podium, Mike. Good morning. It's, uh, it's great to be back among friends. It's a couple of years since I've been in the building and it's, uh, it's wonderful to see some, some, uh, so many faces that, uh, that I know. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's been an interesting first talk, and some of the things I say hopefully will build on on what uh, William has said. Uh, with respect to digital skills, uh, you can see that I didn't manage to remove the highlighting. I spent about five minutes trying to get the highlighting off that. wasn't successful, so straight away I know there's a, there's a skill I actually need. Um, I'm the immediate past president of CEFI. That was a two-year term, and that finished at the end of September. Um, uh, but it's probably one of the reasons why I'm standing here and addressing you today. Um, so um, I'm going to try and stick to 15 minutes. There's far too many slides in my pack uh, for that, so I want to try and zero in. Um, initially, uh, the focus of this was going to be on the sustainable development goals and digitalization. So I'm going to say a little about that. And then I want to talk a little bit more about skills and competences, networking, and broadening the curriculum, um, providing my perspectives. So in terms of superficial thoughts on the sustainable development goals and digitalization, um, what I want to say is, um, first of all, uh, I stand here as an engineer. I stand here in Engineers Ireland. I'm wearing the tie. I identify as an engineer. Um, and engineering as a profession is normative. Almost everything we do is normative. Um, our education is generally done by engineers. Our programs are accredited by Engineers Ireland, or if it's international, by an accrediting body. Um, when we have external examiners on our programs, they are typically engineers. When we validate our programs, we bring in engineers. Everything we do has engineers involved in the education and in the assessment of engineering. That is inherently normative. The advantages of that are that we have consistency and we've got quality. I want to come back to whether that's sufficient at the end of the talk. Um, I also will say that anything I say is a generalization, and generalizations are always undermined by other examples. So I will make some generalizations, but you can always find examples that say, but Mike, you're wrong. Um, so that's the way it is. Engineering education, despite its normative nature, is not homogenous and is not static. And in fact, there's a range of changes that are occurring. And um, I do believe that there's a pendulum starting to swing away from the more traditional uh, approach to engineering. 
but still the dominant view of engineering is, if you like, a, a, an engineering skills oriented curriculum. Um, and the superficial thoughts on, on the two ideas with respect to sustainable development goals and digitalization is that the uh, European deans of engineering in general are comfortable addressing uh, the sustainable development goals. It provides a burning platform to try and get some changes into, uh, into curricula where deans, heads of school typically struggle to affect what's actually happening in the classroom. Uh, and deans are, are as yet nervous about the unknown impact of digitalization. Um, and we've had a, a dean's convention that looked at this. Um, we had a second convention uh, that touched on it. Um, you can look at the positives in terms of digitalization can facilitate online learning and blended learning. And you can look at the negatives with respect to uh, digital disruption and the broader skills that students supposedly are going to develop. But the way our structures are set up, we don't necessarily have the ability to provide them. So uh, I would make those two points. Um, but certainly, in terms of sustainable development goals, universities are beginning to align towards the relevant goals. They provide a compelling burning platform. And in fact, um, you know, for, for institutional leaders, um, you can now look at world university rankings and explore the university impact rankings for individual SDGs. So if you were to be cynical and, and look at rankings in a, a way that is a glass half full or a glass half empty, um, in fact, now you can start to look at your ranking with respect to the sustainable development goals. And I, I actually don't think that that is necessarily a great view. On the other hand, you can start to look at the impact that your university has. Skills and competences. Um, you'll hear later on this morning um, uh, two talks with respect to um, uh, student skills. What skills should our students be developing and then that they have as, uh, as graduates? And one of the interesting points to build on a point that, uh, that William made is that one of the things that is now popping up as a, as a discussion point is whether in fact, and this is within engineering education, whether transferable skills are the new core which is a, an amazing statement um, as a question. To what extent do we need to focus more on providing those transferable skills? And of course, how do we do it? And the question then, if you look at a substitution argument, how much engineering do you take out of an engineering program and you still graduate engineers? And there's, there is a question there associated with that. Um, so you'll hear more about skills for students and graduates this morning. If you look at an example from the Royal Academy of Engineering, it's an update to their 2013 Perkins Review. Uh, this is a 2018 update. Uh, I put the highlight in. Uh, they talk about the need to ensure that all young people develop the broad range of technical communication and problem solving skills that will serve them and our society over the coming decades, both as wealth creators and as citizens. And I want to come back to the wealth creators as well in a few minutes. So we focus on the skills of students. But what about the skills of our engineering educators? Why do we assume that all of our engineering educators can teach effectively? We hire them as engineers, and then we put them in the classroom. How do we know they can teach? How do we know they can teach effectively? How do we know whether they know how students learn? We assume it. So for the most part, when we recruit, we recruit on the basis of, it might be some industry experience, but we're certainly looking to know what their area of research is going to be. We want them to be researchers in polymers, for example. Um, what on-the-job professional development do we require of them? Within TU Dublin, we have a requirement that all of our new academics have to complete a postgrad certificate in teaching and learning. And that has been fundamentally successful for us. But we still only have about 30% of our academics have gone through that postgrad certificate in teaching and learning. Most other colleges and universities in Ireland don't have that requirement. And across Europe, most do not have that requirement either. And we, while we require it of new faculty within TU Dublin, we don't require it of people like myself or others who've been there and predate the grandfather clause uh, predating the actual implementation of that policy. Typically, universities provide supports to people who want to become better teachers, but they have to ask for that. You can't make them take 
the, the programs to develop them as better teachers. How do we measure their teaching competence? Has anybody in the room had a discussion with a faculty member who has a reputation of not being a great teacher? And how has that worked out for you? Are our promotion and tenure criteria aligned? So if we talk about having great teaching, how do we actually promote and provide tenure and security to the faculty that we have? Are our P&T criteria still aligned to research? Or are we in fact in a balanced mode? And this is where I think the traditional institutes of technology in Ireland probably are slightly better, better being a, a, again a qualitative word, uh, than, uh, than universities. Um, and this is something that American universities are starting to look at in more detail. And they are, progressive universities, major progressive universities like Purdue, are trying to ensure that people are promoted on the basis of their teaching excellence. I'm going to breeze over this. The Royal Academy of Engineering um, uh, came out with a career framework for university teaching. And you might want to look at this, particularly if you're in a leadership position within, uh, within your university. It's an open access resource to help universities evaluate and reward the teaching achievements of their academic staff. The link is there. It's a framework that supports professional development. It's for use by all academics. And it's for application across disciplinary and geographic contexts. And it makes a lot of sense. There are four levels, beginning with you're an effective teacher. Uh, and it tells you what that means and, and what you need to do. You can be a skilled and collegial teacher. Up to level three, you can be an institutional leader in teaching and learning. And then you can be a national global leader in teaching and learning. And there are some universities across Europe that are starting to look at this to try and see how they can instill, perhaps, a teaching track to their academic promotion and tenure, as opposed to simply a research-oriented track. So these are early days. but. I do think that the pendulum is starting to move a little bit back towards better teaching. The American Society of Engineering Education, uh, which is um, a continent-wide body uh, with most of the engineering um, universities in the US, including two-year and four-year non-PhD universities, as well as all the research intensive ones members, they are, I know from my, um, from my contacts, beginning to explore competences and the recognition of expertise for engineering educators. And again, if, if that is adopted by ASCE, uh, it will be significant. And standing here in Engineers Ireland, um, I say uh, and ask the question, should we be looking at this more closely from the perspective of what we're trying to achieve? Um, and I think Engineers Ireland, in terms of your dual role, but particularly with respect to accreditation, uh, could look at that in a constructive way with respect to working with universities. OK, let me move on and, and make a few comments with respect to networking uh, and the value of networking. So first of all, there are individual academics here and there are institutional leaders here. And for the individual academic, the value of networking, how can I stay current? How can I be a better teacher? What pedagogy should I adopt, for example, blended learning or other? If you are alone and isolated, you may struggle with respect to how you want to do that. You get your notes from the previous lecture, and that's what you do. But if you become part of a network, you can share best practice, you can share models and exemplars, and so on. At the institution level, typically questions are, how do we improve our rankings? Can we recruit more and perhaps better students? What partners, what institutional partners do we want? Should we change our entire curriculum? For example, should we go CDIO um, or some other, some other possible model? Which is much harder to do because most of the changes that are actually occurring within engineering education are occurring at the level of the individual academic. The individual teacher decides they're going to flip the classroom. It's not necessarily a program level change. Those are occurring, but not as widely. So these are reasons why networking uh, can be very important. So I'm going to take an example with respect to engineering education research. This is research into engineering education. How do people learn? What's the best way to teach engineering education? What are the best ways to try and develop skills? How do you measure that that's actually working? And you're going to hear some outputs from some of those later on this morning. So in terms of networking, you could, as an individual academic, become part of a university research group. 
My example is from TU Dublin, where we established um, uh, a center for research into engineering and architectural education. We called it CREATE. Um, and that provides a mechanism for academics to come together on a regular basis and share what they're doing, for PhD students to come together and talk about what, what is happening, and to have a support network, as well as a professional network, if you like, to try and share ideas and to talk through issues, etc. You can then move to collaborating with peers annually, and so there is a UK and Ireland Engineering Education Research Network, EERN, um, and then you can connect to a worldwide community of scholars, for example, the REEN Network, uh, the Research and Engineering Education Network, which is an independent, international, and inclusive forum for quality research and engineering education. At least that's how they describe themselves. What possibly could be missing from the above? And so I put it out, standing here um, in Engineers Ireland, uh, once upon a time we, we attempted to develop an academic society, uh, a society within Engineers Ireland focused on providing support to academics teaching engineering across, uh, across Ireland. Perhaps there is value in considering whether we could have a countrywide approach to engineering education research. I'd like to, to make another observation from what I've seen across Europe. And, and there's, I, I suppose there's no surprise here. In my view, it's the research intensive universities. It's the TU Delfts, the KU Leuvens, the Albergs, who have the greatest number of people who are doing research into engineering education. Um, is that my timer? Um, so uh, that's not surprising because they've got critical mass. But I think some of the teaching oriented um, institutions and smaller universities uh, still have a lot that they can learn, but I think they tend to assume that they're already good at teaching and they're not necessarily stitched in to the research that's occurring about how people learn. Uh, my argument. Um, value of networking, um, again, uh, from a CEFI perspective, uh, speaking here as the, the outgoing president of CEFI, uh, on the right-hand side, um, uh, I know it looks like Mutt and Jeff, um, but that's uh, uh, the outgoing commissioner for education, youth and culture, Tibor Navracic, um, and he spoke at our conference last month and talked about the structural changes um, that the DG on education are trying to make. They're trying to bring scale to bear with respect to higher education. They're trying to structurally reduce barriers to mobility of students and staff. Um, and they're looking at the likes of the European Universities Initiative to try and have universities working far more seamlessly together on two plus two initiatives and, and uh, common programs that will allow students to move. And as I say, to bring, to bring scale to bear in a positive way in order for Europe to be positioned to better address what Europe sees as the, the challenges. Uh, I also, you're going to hear from Darren Carthy later this morning, and Darren won best paper um, uh, at our annual conference, again, working with com uh, colleagues in TU Delft and KU Leuven. Um, from an Engineers Ireland perspective, the bottom left um, shows an initiative that Engineers Ireland is connected into as well, and that's the European Engineers Advisory Group. Uh, again, ways that we can try and network uh, uh, and have a, a louder, more coherent voice. Uh, again, more on the European uh, Engineers Europe Advisory Group. Temis Christophe Idou, um, uh, the European Commission DG for Education, explained that the ever-increasing use of technology demands ever stronger digital skills. Again, that's part of the worry that the engineering deans have in terms of how do I address that. Uh, there's a dean's convention, um, which we hold every year, which uh, is, is a very good way to network at the dean's level. Uh, and Una was at that this year, and we missed Ken Thomas. He wasn't at it for the first time in years. Um, now, I want to basically put down a challenge to you uh, with respect to broadening the curriculum. These are my observations. First of all, um, I want to, to set as, a, as a, a, a premise to this, 2018 MIT report, which was done, by the way, by Ruth Graham from, uh, she's a consultant in the UK, and she's done a lot of work with the, the Royal Academy of Engineering as well. Um, but this was M MIT's way of promoting what they do. 
So to promote what they did, they commissioned a report to talk about everything else that was good in the world. I talked to Ed Cawley, who commissioned this study, and, and uh, that's what he, he said to me. But basically, they, they looked at a number of questions, principally which institutions are considered to be the current leaders in engineering education. And of course, because it's the MIT report, MIT shines by reflected light on, on that. Um, so a couple of the trends in the report, and the, tr the report is downloadable, I gave you the link there. Um, and this gets to what William has really talked about with respect to um, uh, the Department of Education and Skills and national government policy here in Ireland. Um, many among this new generation of world leaders in engineering education will be propelled by strategic government investment in engineering education as an incubator for the technology-based entrepreneurial talent that will drive national economic growth. And again, from my view, outside of Europe, that is the case. Um, we had a keynote speaker from Tsinghua University, and basically in private discussions, Tsinghua, uh, the Chinese government has said Tsinghua is to become the, the number one ranked university in the world. There will be no government interference with respect to you doing that. And uh, not just Tsinghua, but the top universities of China have more money than they know how to spend. And they're bringing international scholars in on a regular basis. It used to be the case that if you visited a top Chinese university, they showed you a lab, the lab was locked, and there was a nice piece of kit in there, but it never looked like anybody was using it. You visit a top Chinese university now, and they have more kit uh, and the top, top of the range kit um, than we have the ability to provide here in a country like Ireland. Uh, another trend that the MIT report said was that there is a move towards socially relevant and outward facing engineering curricula, which is good. Um, these curricula emphasize student choice. However, and this is the challenge for most of us in leadership positions, most of this is bolt on activities and are isolated within the curriculum. Now, coming to my challenge. If I went back 100 years ago, um, an American sociologist called Thorstein Veblen, uh, after the First World War, said that the material welfare of the community is unreservedly bound up with the due working of the industrial system, and therefore with its unreserved control by the engineers, who alone are competent to manage it. I have used that quote in so many talks. I love that quote. It says how great I am. He argued that it was solely the engineers who could maximize and optimize the output of the industrial system. If you fast forward C.P. Snow, and probably most of you have read uh, C.P. Snow's argument about the two cultures, technology is a queer thing, a thing. It brings you gifts with one hand and stabs you in the back with the other. And basically, uh, the intellectual life of the Western society split into two cultures, the sciences and the humanities, which is a major hindrance to solving the world's problems. And as engineers and engineering education, we focused solely on the sciences. So, I ask you, if we want to look at broadening the curriculum as engineering educators, should we look only at engineering education or should we choose to look at societal impacts? Are the societal impacts of what we do, and Marguerite referred to some of them, and for the most part we can list all of the, the good things that engineering has wrought, there's no question about that, but what about some of the other societal impacts? Should we be bringing them in as part of our education? Should we be requiring that within engineering education, we must examine the societal impacts of technology and what technology uh, actually brings? Philosopher Carl Mitchum, who by the way is now based in China at Renmin University, but stood in Engineers Ireland 10 years ago uh, at a conference on philosophy and engineering. He argues that neither engineers nor politicians deliberate seriously on the role of engineering in transforming our world. Instead, we limit ourselves to celebratory cliches about economic benefit, national defense, and innovation, an American-oriented paper. But basically, Carl Mitchum has criticized us for not thinking enough about the impacts of what we design and what we build on our society. And his solution is that the engineer should seek self-knowledge through reflection and self-examination. So I took his paper and I looked at his arguments and I developed this table. And I'm calling this the Mitchum Table of Program Enlightenment. And we looked at this, uh, and I'll say how we looked at this in a few minutes. But basically, if you just 
take the argument that engineers transform the world because they can, the effect of that is that engineering education is simply through the core disciplines of engineering. We don't justify engineering at all, or engineering education. We, we produce engineers, they change the world, and that is good. Or we can look at a description whereby engineers transform the world and they can communicate it clearly. So we use social science courses in order to improve the communication skills of engineers. And that's an instrumental justification of our programs. Or we could look at engineers transform the world and they can justify it rationally and contextually. So the effect there would be we can use social sciences or broadening courses to locate engineering projects within their broad, broader social context, an enhanced instrumental justification. Or finally, we could say, as we educate engineers, that they can transform the world and they can reflect on what it means for all of us. So then social science courses would enable critical self-reflection on the meaning of life in a progressively engineered world. Intrinsic value justification. So that's a table. Now, four years ago, myself and two colleagues looked at all of the Level 8 programs in Ireland, all of the Level 8 engineering programs in Ireland. We went online to look at what all institutions said about their programs and where we could examine the programs through either the prospectus or by clicking on the program and getting into the detail, we looked at it. And I was delighted that Damien allowed us to come in and spend two days uh, reading all of the accreditation reports for the previous 10 years for all Level 8 accredited programs in Ireland. And we were looking for evidence to see where we could find level two, three, or four justifications of engineering education. What do you think we found? We only found a small number of examples of instrumental justification level two. Almost every program that we saw evidence for had really no justification. Now, you can criticize what we did. We simply read the, the accreditation reports and we looked at what was actually um, on the website. I would bet that if I talked to individual lecturers, every one of them or most of them would say, yeah, but we build that into the course we teach. We build that into how we position, for example, structural engineering and a bridge and the, and the value of the bridge, etc. But what I'm trying to say is, at the level of the program, it's not built in. At least there's no evidence that you can see that it's built in. And I think this comes back to the sustainable development goals, and we can use the sustainable development goals as the rationale, as the burning platform to try and bring some of this in and have the pendulum move towards a broader type of engineering education. Again, going back to the Perkins report, uh, emphasizing another, my emphasis, there is a clear business case for a more inclusive engineering profession to attract and retain a more diverse engineering workforce. Why? Because the engineering workforce is male and white, for the most part. I sat around my faculty of engineering table a number of years ago looking at my heads of school and realized that we were a bunch of middle-aged white guys educated in the 70s. We don't reflect society. I had another slide, it's not there. Well, I'm gonna come back to the point in saying that, that engineering is normative, um, provides good quality and consistency, uh, but in fact, it's limiting. Uh, engineering education as a normative endeavor um, really is something that we need to look at. Um, we need to look at what is the engineer in the 21st century. Later on this morning, there's gonna be talk about accreditation. Uh, and, and how we get credit, and people like Maria have some interesting ideas on that. But I do think we need to look at not just the criteria within a, accreditation, but how we assess those criteria when we move around as well, and perhaps consider having non-engineers on the accreditation panels as well. So um, I probably run way over time. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much, Mike. Very thought-provoking, and I'm sure, again, items we'll uh, come back to later on.
so uh, moving on now, our next presentation is from uh, Kevin Rodden, who is the president of the European Federation of Consulting Engineering Associations. He has over 20 years experience as a civil and a structural engineer. He's a chartered engineer and a fellow of Engineers Ireland. He was appointed director of Garland Consultancy in 1999 and then subsequently became CEO in 2010. He is also a director of the Construction IT Alliance and a past president of the Association of Consulting Engineers of Ireland. Hard to get all of that in a business card, I'd say, Kevin. You. You're very welcome. Uh, thanks, Marguerite. Um, delighted to be here today. Um, it's been very, very informative uh, to date. Um, I suppose you're going to be crucified with acronyms um, all day. Um, EFCA is probably a new one for you. It's the European Federation of Consulting Engineering Associations. Um, we only have 28 members. Uh, that's one in each of 28 countries. It's the national um, association of consulting engineers in each country would be our members. Um, the ACI in Ireland is the, the Irish member. Uh, and I'm glad, Eureka, we have um, a Swedish member as well. Um, it's it's very interesting to hear about this crisis that's coming down the line because I don't think it's coming down the line. I think the crisis is here. Um, I remember figures from 2013 where there was more zoology graduates than civil engineering graduates in that year. Um, in the middle of recession, I think we need more engineers than, than zoology graduates, but that's what we had. Um, when I talk to consulting engineers across Ireland, what we're actually finding at the moment is about one in six to one in eight of the um, the new staff we take on in our companies uh, is Irish. The rest are from outside the country. Um, there is agencies full time now trying to recruit staff um, across the world and, and bring them in. Um, the the um, the new critical skills visa extension for civil engineers has been an enormous benefit to us because the backlog we had in finding staff is starting to be filled now. Um, but it just demonstrates that the crisis is here. Um, it's, um, it, it's certainly with us. Um, networking, Mike mentioned, was, was so important. And he spoke about the, um, um, the Engineering uh, Europe Advisory Group. That's something we're involved with as well in, in AFCA. Uh, we work very closely with FIANI. Um, FIANI is the, the European um, Association um, of um, Engineering Associations, um, which um, Engineers Ireland would be a member of. Um, I'm taking a bit of a, a different tact this morning, and um, what I was asked to do was to, to look at the future of the consulting engineering industry um, and to um, identify um, what changes we see coming down the line because the education system obviously um, needs to, to be aware of, of what our industry is looking at. Um, every year we produce a future trends um, booklet. Um, it's free to download on our website. And basically it's, it's our view of the, um, the changes coming down the line for talents, tools, and technologies. Um, engineers are people, uh, sometimes people forget that. Um, so everything is, is, is based around the individual and preparing uh, the individual. Um, the booklet is prepared with input from, from Italy, Serbia, Belgium, Ireland, uh, Germany, uh, and France. Um, we look at a couple of different areas, um, agile management, economics, um, big data, artificial intelligence, uh, digital dashboards, uh, visualization, and dematerialization. And the convergence of three digital accelerators, computer power, bandwidth, and digital, te digital technology, now make possible what was previously impossible. To be successful nowadays, rather than imitate the past, it's important that, uh, it's important that we concentrate our efforts on achieving what our competitors are, are not yet doing and try to find that white space. So in this report, we further explore the trends that will disrupt the global engineering and architecture industries. 
And it's irrelevant whether we as an association endorse or support uh, these individual um, ideas or trends, because the future is inevitable. It's going to happen anyway, whether we like it or not. The only constant is change, and the rate of that change is increasing uncontrollably. And our goal is really to expose the European engineering community to the possibilities and opportunities that will inevitably be created, and more importantly, the consequence of not, um, uh, not realising that. So we challenge the industry to the courage to transform ourselves, to abandon preconceived frameworks, and to embrace new models and try, uh, try new experience that will allow us to evolve as an industry and a society. The transformation won't be easy. Uh, transformation never is easy. Um, there's many challenges and obstacles as we try to reconcile these future trends with the legal, regulatory and liability precedents that have both constrained us and protected us uh, for generations. Um, I came across this um, um, quote, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then the video has to be worth at least 1.8 million. I don't know the maths behind it, but it sounds good anyway. Um, on the Future Trends booklet we have produced, um, we have um, on every page introducing every topic, we have a short uh, three minute video um, just to uh, explain the, the rationale behind it. So how can we teach engineering students to adopt principles that haven't yet been considered yet? to use technologies that haven't yet been invented. We can't, and that's, that's the big challenge. But what we can do is teach them anticipatory skills to recognize, to exploit, and capitalize on these opportunities as they arise. Likewise, we need an alternative strategy for our companies based on anticipation to recognize and interpret foreseeable future trends. So what we really need is anticipatory organizations. So the first concept we look at is Agile management. And Agile management is about working smarter rather than harder. It's about doing more work in less time. It's about, about generating more work, more value from less work. Uh, it's idyllic, isn't it? Um, and I don't think anyone could possibly object to it. I think it's something we're all striving towards. Um, from an agile management point of view, if we have a look first of all at the world we live in, um, traditionally um, the world was seen as um, um, uh, centralized. Uh, there was a, a degree of formality, there was tight reign, there was imposed discipline. Uh, you look at what's going on at the House of Commons over the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's no way we're, we're hitting any of those criteria. Um, you look at the, the, the international political agenda, that's not there. Um, and likewise, the management practices that we used to have were deterministic, predictable, orderly, and certain. Uh, but in today's world, um, you know, in, a, in a, an unpredictable world, um, in a disorderly world, um, <laughs> Uh, certainly, we have to change the practices to suit um, the, the criteria that's, that's placed in front of us. So essentially, we need to look at agile management. So trying to exploit technology and data with the management pr and practices that are still per se, per pervasive in so many big corporations is like driving a horse and buggy on the freeway. Uh, it's just not going to work, and there's no point in, in trying to, to make it work. So we look at the core characteristics that have embraced Agile. Um, the first one is the, the law of the small team. Um, Agile practitioners share the mindset that we should work in principle in small, autonomous, cross-functional teams. We should work in short cycles on relatively small tasks and getting continuous feedback um, from the ultimate customer and end user. That's really what we do in consulting engineering. Um, the agile practitioners are obsessed with delivering value to the customer. So in the digital era, the whole idea is to put the customer center. The firm works around the customer. Traditionally, it was the other way around. And the other one is the law of the network. 
where the traditional approach was the command of teams. You had teams, you had a, a, a structure, each of the teams reported back to somebody who reported back to somebody. Um, now what we have is a fluid and transparent network of players that are collaborating towards a common goal of delighting customers. Decisions shall be based on who's best placed to make the decision and not who has the place in the formal hierarchy. It's about creating value for the customer rather than extracting value from the customer. So consulting engineering is very, very suited to agile management um, because every project needs to satisfy the customer. And the success of every project depends on the ability to manage integrated information and effectively apply the law of the network. And the management of an engineering company needs to be primarily a hierarchy of competence and not a hierarchy of um, authority. So if we look at, at Wikinomics, um, originally a wiki was seen as a software that allows a large number of people to edit a document on the internet, but it has become a metaphor now for collaboration. So Wikinomics is effectively the practice and theory of collaboration. It's the economics of collaboration. There's a lot of stories out there that will, will demonstrate how Wikinomics actually works. And uh, one of the, the most commonly quoted ones is, is Gold Corp. Um, it's a gold mining company. Um, and the CEO was frustrated that his geologist couldn't tell him if he had gold and if he had gold where the gold was. He was about to shut down the company because he couldn't mine if he didn't know where to mine. So um, he came up with the Gold Corp challenge. So he published all his geological information on the net um, and had a competition. Anyone who could tell him if he had gold and where the gold was uh, would share in a prize of half a million dollars. He got 77 different entries um, and a number of them had come up with technologies he hadn't even heard of. His geologists hadn't even come across them, hadn't mentioned them, um, didn't know they existed. And for his half million prize fund, he got 3.4 billion worth of gold. Um, and, and that's what Wikinomics is all about. It's like a group of mu musicians, rather than insisting on composing unpublished pieces, that they rearrange previously composed pieces and succeed in producing a work of art. So really it's a question of recomposing things that are already done by others. Um, I was at a conference recently in, in Mexico, uh, it was the, the FIDIC conference, and we had a, a brilliant speaker, um, Stephen Borost. Um, he's um, the Chief Technology Officer of Teradata Corporation, and he also served as Barack Obama's Chief Technology Advisor for a number of years. And basically, in his view, every company in the world, uh, including consulting engineering companies, um, there's three different choices for those companies in the, the new economy. Um, one is companies that are data companies. And a lot of engineering companies wouldn't necessarily think they are data companies. Um, the second option is companies that will become data companies. And the third one is the companies that will become extinct. <laughs> so that's where our industry is moving. Um, some people are in option one. Um, some people are, are, are in two and wondering how they get into one. And hopefully nobody is going to end up in three because we all know what happened to dinosaurs. So data is like the new oil. Um, we need to find it, we need to extract it, we have to refine it, distribute it, and monetize it. So unlike physical assets, data does not get used up. It can be replicated and used in multiple applications without diminishing its value. And in fact, the value actually can be increased um, when a sort of a data network effect. There's more data has been created in the last three years than the previous 40,000 years. The data in the world doubles every two years. Storage must therefore increase to keep pace. Cloud becomes an attractive economic solution. But where is your cloud uh, storage held? What jurisdiction? 
Is it safe? Who can use it? Why is that important? Um, Estonia has opened up the world's first data embassy in Luxembourg, and it's just a demonstration of the, the consideration people have on the value and the security um, uh, they place on their data. So data is the oil that fuels artificial intelligence. But whose data is fueling that artificial intelligence? Is it my data? Is it your data? Um, that's why security is so important. So artificial intelligence will accelerate project execution. It offers competitive advantages to firms who can exploit such an opportunity. Artificial intelligence is, is not the solution for everything. Uh, and I was delighted to hear um, uh, Marguerite's figures this morning, uh, 94% and 2%. Uh, so I'll remember those. Um, but um, what it is, is that the chances of success is far greater using artificial intelligence. There's a lot of the large um, consulting engineering practices around the world already using artificial intelligence on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, not so much in this part of the world. Um, artificial intelligence is not an alternative to modeling a design using BIM, but it's something to complement that modeling action. So are all of the artificial intelligence applications in use today are what the industry refers to as narrow AI. They're very good at behaving intelligently when applied to one well-defined area of expertise. However, the systems are miles away from general artificial intelligence. General artificial intelligence is, is where it, it, um, a system that can act intelligently across a wide range of environments and problems in a similar way to a person. Because we have all this data, the next important thing we have to have is digital dashboards. So it's like a dashboard in a car. It gives you feedback on the state of your, your vehicle and crucially, allows the, the driver a chance to change um, the way they're driving before catastrophe strikes. So with no dashboard, the only way we, we realize our car runs out of fuel is when it stops. Um, so the digital dashboard is, is the ability, uh, it, it's a visual presentation of performance measures. It's information we already have. It's the ability to make more informed decisions and gain visibility of all our systems in real time. Um, visualization, as engineers and architects, we're all dreamers. We're capable of incorporating our dreams into our designs and then turning them into reality. Um, dreams live in, live in a, a completely intangible world, a virtual reality that's not yet materialized. It's often distorted and intensified. As such, it's augmented uh, compared to real reality. But the challenge we have is how can we translate what's in our minds um, before it actually appears as a, a built project. So IKEA recently came across a problem where 14% of all the returns they had were due to customers wrongly assessing the size of, of furniture um, items that they purchased. So they developed a new augmented reality catalog. You put on the headset and you see how the particular sofa will fit in your own room um, before you buy it. Are the colors right? Are the sizes right? Um, we can imagine from a design perspective, and um, certainly as someone who designs a lot of hospitals, if we can give a headset to a surgeon and let them see what the operating theatre looks like before it's built, um, because we have a history in this country of, of building operating theatres, and then when the surgeons walk around them, they decide, no, they're too small, they want them bigger. So 3D printing is, is something that certainly is, is with us. Um, and um, it's just the last concept that I want to share with you. So 3D printers have become relatively cheap in recent years and their use is, is, is spreading. So the Winston Corporation in, um, in China, and there's a misprint there, they produce 10 20 square meter um, houses per day, not 200 square meter. 
um, at a cost of 5,000 per house. Um, they print individual modules and put them together in apartment blocks in the top right hand corner. And then they can build large villas in the bottom right hand corner by um, um, putting together various modules. Um, this is happening today. Um, if we look at uh, D-Shape, which is a company in Italy, Enrico Dini is the, the engineer uh, responsible. Um, he spent years in the, the, the shoe industry um, producing fashion shoes. And then he looked at some of the technology there to see, well, how can that be used in a, a wider engineering function? And you see in the top right hand corner, it's the first 3D printed bridge um, in Spain um, that has been developed. And um, he uses sand as his basic component for 3D printing, um, which makes it affordable. Um, he's also printing uh, low cost housing for Africa and is involved in um, uh, rebuilding or reprinting um, um, a UNESCO heritage site that was damaged in Syria. So just to summarize, what should we do next? Um, we need to stay calm and understand how to use uh, and control the available technology. We need to communicate and don't hesitate to share your ideas to discover more. That's what we're doing today. From a technological perspective, um, that's what C to do. Um, what you find is if you make an investment, you share your ideas, uh, you'll get it back uh, in multiples. Implement new management methods to ensure innovation and experimentation through fast feedback cycles with end users. users. Take decisions using simulations, data, analysis and information. Learn how to organize information on a dashboard designed for each project. Learn how to implement cognitive um, collaboration, so collaboration with computers. And I suppose it, it's let's develop anticipatory um, educational models. Thank you. Thanks, meeting Kevin. Fascinating presentation again around uh, maybe the direction of travel, particularly with data and some new skills. Uh, so. Really, really interesting. So uh, now to add, I suppose, a certain European, if not international, flavour to our uh, conference today. Uh, we're delighted to have Ulrika Lindstrand with us, who's the president of the Swedish Association of Graduate Engineers. That's written in Swedish in front of me as well, but I'm not going to attempt it. Uh, she's um, The, the uh, association is an engineering trade union and interest organisation, and it represents 153,000 members, so it's a huge organisation. Ulrika herself is a chemical engineer, and she's held various positions in the pharmaceutical company McNeil over the last 20 years. And she is also uh, a, an expert in pyrotechnics, which must make you really popular at this time of the year. So you're very welcome, Ulrika. Thank you. Right. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Engineers Island for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I know it's been hours since you had coffee last time, so bear with me. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. I have only three slides, but I will talk some more. Um, so, I will... Um, uh, I will. I will just start to to give a, some short prerequisites about what I'm going to present to you. Um, Sweden is known for a lot of things: uh, ABBA, Volvo, Spotify, Avicii, so on. Uh, we are we are also very well known for having a model. All of you who are working in in international context, I'm sure you've heard some Swedes saying. In Sweden, we have a model or a system. We love to prepare things and we love the consensus things, which is why everything we do has quite a good quality to it, but it takes forever to get there. Um, and once it's there in place, we don't want to change it because it took us forever to get there. It could be good to know. We're also famous for having high taxes, amongst the highest taxes in the world. Um, and what do we get for our money? Uh, Amongst a lot of things, we do get free education. Excellent. So uh, going into higher education doesn't cost us a thing, except that we need to try to make a living during the time we're studying. But it doesn't cost us a thing. We don't pay tuition. Um, so how, how does our university get funded? They get funded by the government through the tax system. Um, 
and I will go a little bit into that later, but it's good for you to know that that's the case. Um, yeah, let's see if I missed something. Um, no, I think that is about what you need to know for the moment. Otherwise, you need to contact me afterwards and ask me. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, Study Friday, what is that? Uh, first of all, it's a collaboration. And there's a lot of logos uh, there on your right hand side, and a lot of long names, other things in Swedish. Short things become enormously huge in English. Don't know why, but that's the case. So, Study Friday is a concept where uh, Sverige Sinkunjören, which is the Swedish version of the Swedish uh, Association of Graduate Engineers. So, uh, we were actually tired about nothing happened when it came to uh, CPD for professional engineers. Nothing. Another thing you need to know is that engineering is not a regulated profession in Sweden. Whoever wants to could call themselves an engineer. It's up to your employer's organization or employer to find out if you really are an engineer and can do what you say you can. Uh, that can sound tricky to you, but we have uh, a lot of other authorities and, and regulations in place to make sure that we know what we do and, and uh, can build bridges and so forth without them uh, falling down. Um, it's also been good for a small country like Sweden because once we've had crashes in some branches, you can quite easily go to work in another branch without taking a full new curricula, which is good. Um, so, um, nothing really happened when it came to CPD uh, for professional engineers. Our government was talking about this and been talking about it forever. So, Sveriges uh, Ingenieur decided to look at it. What can we do? So, we started by in in inviting uh, the rectors of the uh, six or seven uh, largest uh, higher institutions, could be universities, could be others that offer uh, engineering education, uh, and also the six largest technical employers organizations. Because we wanted to have the full perspective, what can we do as engineers and individuals, what do the companies need and what can they provide in this? and also what can our higher, higher education institutions provide, what do they want and what do they need to get there. So that's what we're doing. So we've been, uh, we've been working on this project for almost two years. Um, and it, the, the fact that it took two years was not a, a thing of consensus actually, uh, because we were uh, very much aligned from the, from, uh, from the start. It was more like getting everyone in the same room because the agendas were fully packed. So that is why it took about two years. Okay, uh, being uh, I'm still working as a uh, engineer, so I sort of love to put up my boxes and box things in to be able to explain what I'm, uh, what the concept is. So I'll go through them quite quickly, at least I hope it will go quickly, uh, so we don't miss out on the coffee. Um, but we started by identifying uh, barriers to competence shifts and development of competence from the different perspectives, uh, individuals, companies, university and university colleges, and the challenges were um, accessibility, form and content, and financing. So if I start with the individual perspective, uh, the accessibility, um, currently the admission to our courses at university and colleges is it's carried out through the same national application system as for regular programs for, for students directly from college. Uh, and it's also at one time, one single time at the year. Not perfect, uh, because that means it could actually be up to nine months before you get accepted and can start your education. And during those nine months, a lot can happen. Uh, basically, your employer can say that, no, congratulations to you, you are uh, admitted, but uh, no, I can't spare you for the moment. Or you might have changed your job, or something else might have happened. So that is not uh, excellent. Um, 
it can also be quite tricky to get an overview because everyone has their admission at the same time. And even if we, we are a small country, we have a lot of different courses. How are you going to keep track of all of them? If you have to, cho to, to take a choice at one, one time of year, everything is open, then it closes. Um, form and content. Teaching activities, uh, as you might well know, are usually offered during regular working hours. And usually it's not like packed through uh, at the top of the day or in the afternoon, it's spread all over. That's not uh, really a good thing if you need to uh, work at the same time. Um, and also courses at an advanced level may also um, include um, quite a, a big amount of, of um, generic content and that might not really be what we as a professional uh, would like to go uh, since we've been working for a while and uh, we could find it too basic. Um, also the organization of the courses does not really take into consideration that, that as a professional you might have to work at the same time um, and you might have a family situation which makes it a bit hard to to take on a, a long program or to travel and to combine it uh, with life and, and work in general. Um, also if you need to go to universities the courses and exams can be held a quite a long distance from where you live and work. So the financing then uh, if you are to attend a course or longer education at a university or college, it often means a significant loss of income if you can't work uh, um, the way you used to do. And if you have loans and family commitments, uh, that might be perceived as an insurmountable obstacle, of course. So, for the company perspective, um, the admission to the courses, uh, since it's usually, as I mentioned before, taking place centrally and it takes time, it's not that easy for them to plan when they can let go of their employees, uh, enable for them to participate. Uh, they need to plan in long term and uh, during the waiting period, uh, needs or preconditions may actually change a lot. Uh, and there might also be the other case that sometimes you can run into um, a financial situation or others that time suddenly frees up and you want to send your employee to uh, a course or, or a program uh, and that is not doable if, it's the, the, if you should apply just once a year and start the year after. Um, Um, yeah. um, when it comes to the form and content, the training for professionals obviously need to be flexible. Um, it also needs to have the right form and content for company employees in order for the, uh, for the companies to send their employees, otherwise it's not really relevant. Um, it also needs to to be courses that are concentrated, uh, that has a concentrated rate of study um, because it's hard for the companies to let their people be away and they might need a replacement for the time and uh, for their time and in order to do that then they, actually, they need to know how long uh, are my employee going to be away, do I, is, do I need to put in a replacement uh, for how long time is it relevant to put in a replacement or not? So there's a lot of, of uh, uh, things that has to do with forming content. Um, and when it comes to financing, if if you look at how to finance high quality higher education for your employees, that can be quite expensive. Uh, at least if you look from the employer's point of view. So that actually puts an emphasis on the training and the education to be highly relevant and it also needs to be of sufficient quality, uh, otherwise it might not be meaningful to, uh, for them to allow their employees to take part. So for the university perspective then, 
we go back to the accessibility and the centralized and term-wise admission, they are not really happy about this either. You might think it would be. I mean, it would be easy to know that everyone had their admission once a year and that's fine. But they don't really want that. Uh, I, we were quite surprised to find that out, but they don't really want that, at least not in Sweden. Uh, they also perceive this as somewhat cumbersome and, and a source of uncertainty. Who would know? Um, when it comes to the forming content then, uh, the um, continuing education students, they often have work experience and they are no longer used to full-time studies. No, I, I know I'm not sure I would uh, myself want to go back to study full-time. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. But my God, when you sleep. I don't want to live on noodles. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I, I'm quite happy that I'm doing what I'm doing right now, so I don't have to. Anyways, it is somewhat of a, of a problem. Um, obviously, they may have a job and a family situation, and uh, the courses may need to be adapted in form, content, and location to make it possible to combine these things. When it comes to uh, the financing, um, in Sweden, the financing for our universities has generally been governed by the dominant activities of research and program education. And when I say program education, I mean program education for new or for fresh college students. So, so that's been the emphasis of the system. Um, and our universities and higher education institutions find it uh, quite unclear um, because they find it difficult managing courses for which they do not have clear, clear instructions or funding. At the moment they get um, the funding comes in um, separately. They got one part of the funding when the students, the new students are admissed, uh, have, are starting their programs and they get the other funding when they take, uh, when they graduate, when they take credits. Um, and if I were to go back and, and, and go into a certain course, I might not be interested in taking a new exam or add on more credits to my curriculum, since I don't really need that, uh, since engineering is not a regulated profession. Um, I might just be happy with acquiring the competence and then go back to work, which means that uh, the university at the moment doesn't get paid. If I were to go and, and not take my exam, they would not get paid the other half. So uh, if they were now to, with the system we have now, if they were to uh, admit a lot more professionals into the programs, they would have to actually take money from the program students to put in for the uh, professional students. But we still need to maintain the quality, of course, uh, in the uh, program uh, education. Really important. So that's why it's not really happening at the moment. So the financing, the financing is really, really important. And um, they do not get financing at the moment. Um, also, and I'm sure all of you that works in academia know what a challenge it is to shorten the lead time and the delivery time of creating new curriculums. Um, it's, it's tough. So that is something they identified uh, as well. Um, so basically, there's no incentive or financial space to, expect, uh, to accept students on standalone courses, including professionals. Um, and um, um, yeah, I think I've gone through a bit of this, so I won't go into that. All right, so let's see. What did we come up to then after having uh, identified all these challenges. We have seven proposals and uh, we believe that it realized it could lead to uh, a greater interest and participation in further and continuing training education all over Sweden. Not just for engineers, this could be used by other professions as well. Um, so I'll start with the first one. We call the concept Study Friday, and what? why do we do that? It's not because we have another organization calling themselves 
uh, Fridays for Future. This is another Fridays for Future, but that's not why we actually took the name. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, we are moving into a new culture in the professional world, uh, leading up to that continuous learning is essential. We can no longer sit uh, on our uh, on our um, uh, 40 year old education that we got once. We need to change it several times uh, during our careers. Um, and the Study Friday concept could be an opportunity for professionals to build on their degrees and to return to individual academic studies. Uh, even if the company, uh, company cannot offer commission training. If uh, the professional edu educational activity could take place on Fridays, the predictability becomes greater for everyone involved and uh, planning uh, would, would really improve for, for all our partners. Uh, the universities can focus and adapt their courses um, and um, if they put, to put them on Fridays they could uh, supplement them where appropriate uh, to other forms uh, such as interactivity, um, part-time studies, distant learning, um, blended learning, open online courses and so forth. Um, and by condensing campus teaching to Fridays uh, and enabling joint project assignments uh, or laboratory sessions with program students, um, we could see that Study Friday could provide maximum benefits for everyone involved, uh, resulting in high quality of education, not only for the professionals, but also for the program stu students, because they would to interact uh, with uh, professionals. And that is one thing our students are uh, very much requesting. They want to, to be able to interact and to learn more of what is expected of me uh, in, in my working career and what am I going to use all this theory I'm, I'm learning for, uh, which the professionals then could provide them with feedback too. Okay. More flexible visions. You saw it coming, didn't you? <laughs> I've been talking a lot about it. Uh, if we if we change the admission, um, then the courses by the higher education institutions could be opened up to more participants. Um, continuous admission and flexible courses uh, courses start could be offered for individual courses, and if we had more courses specially designed for professionals there would be no competition for places with program students. Um, also, which is a bit already the case, but it could be better, alumni can be easily welcomed back to their universities. Uh, and I would say that those who have a bachelor or university engineering degree or a higher degree from a Swedish higher education institution um, should be e more easily admitted uh, using a simpler uh, procedure um, to certain continuing or further education courses. And, and not only for your original home institution, but that should be apply applicable all over Sweden. So I myself start, uh, studied at Chalmers Techn Technical University, and, and with this I could take a course at KTH or somewhere else uh, instead of just being referred to my uh, home university. Um, this would need the universities to, or and educational institution to uh, share information about the courses and programs. Um, and of course, the applicant um, that the applicant has taken. Um, and also, structures and systems need to be dev developed in order to do this. Uh, and also, we need to focus on validation of previous education and experience to make this work. That's part of it. Increased collaboration on education for professionals. Um, well, we are all living in a global world and we have more international competition than ever. So if we are to do this and make sure that when companies want to send their employees uh, to upskill or reskill, they would, they would now have the world uh, as their oyster. So why would they choose um, an education in Sweden? So we need it, we really need to stay um, relevant and competitive. Um, 
And in order to be able to do that, the companies need to express where are we going, where do we see ourselves in a couple of years. Because our universities and colleges are not really readers of, of minds. They need to be told what, uh, so that they set up the relevant courses, of course. Um, so the col collaboration between the companies and the universities must be strengthened and formalized. And I think that this report in itself is a testament to the strength of collaboration. And I'm sorry for the layout. I, I have a Swedish one, glossy and beautiful, not so, but this, it's really small. It's not, it's like eight pages. Um, so, so, uh, but it's, it's very powerful. Um, yeah. Um, and then we have the division of courses into constituent elements. We need the courses to be modulized uh, so that course elements can be picked, selected and combined uh, and make the elements of courses more accessible to the individuals. If you can pick your own curricula, that would make it more interesting uh, and, and also it will possibly uh, help out with the motivation because it can be hard to go back once you are uh, used to working uh, and if you can pick yourself what you want to, to study instead of going into a, a program that will make life a lot easier and, and uh, more motivating. All right. Um, so the higher education institutions, they need a specified continuing education operational area with associated funding in addition to the basic task of undergraduate education. This touch upon what I told you earlier about the system, how they get the financing going. Uh, and the weighing between these two groups uh, of, of uh, getting money where the students come in and, and the second part where they actually take their credits or exams. You could the weighing in between them could be changed so that larger proportions of the grants are given on the basis of the number of students uh, rather than on the performance. Uh, that might sound a bit, but, but since it's actually about training professionals, I wouldn't have liked that model for, for new, obviously, because you, you, make, you need to make sure that they that, that uh, the, the quality of the case education is really, really good. Not have, having said that, not meaning that it's not important for good quality for the professionals, but uh, I, I'm sure you, you can, you can grasp, grasp the context of what I'm saying. Um, but it could also, um, the institutions could also be given the opportunity to award course participant certificates instead of credits, and they could actually get financed by that in a way. So that could ease up things. Um, then from the company view, um, we have um, in 2014, the Swedish parliament introduced new rules on reduced employer contributions, which is sort of a tax um, for people working with research and development. Um, and we would like to see a skills development deduction for employers because the continuing education is inherently free of cost but it may still entail additional costs for the employer uh, in terms of loss of pr um, production, uh, salary compensation etc, um, taking in um, replacement. Um, so we would like to see that companies could be allowed to make uh, tax deductions, a sort of skills uh, development deduction in the same manner as for uh, research and development or for investment in facilities. If you can have the tax deduction for investment in facilities, why not in investment in people? And then for the individual. Uh, opportunities for financial compensation for participant loss of income important otherwise you will not get people to leave their well-paid jobs and go into uh, the educational system as i told you before no one wants to go back to the olden days where you lived on noodles or knäcke bröd um so 
Of course, the continued development of individual competence is central to companies' continued competitiveness. Um, so the development programs or courses should be based on individual agreements at company level. So you have to, it's hard to regulate this on a central level. It has to be made in, in, um, uh, in a comp at a company level um, how the individual should progress in order to, um, to stay competitive and to continue uh, increase their competence, not only to be able to do the work you do today in a better way, but be relevant for the future of the company. Um, so, in order to be able to do this, uh, the participants may need to reduce their working hours, um, and that might lead to a corresponding reduction in income, of course. So, whether the employer and or maybe the state should finance the loss of income is something that we need to discuss further. Um, when we spoke to our Minister of, of Higher Education and Research, she was quite thrilled about this. Uh, not to say uh, uh, the latest, well, our Minister of uh, Enterprise and Innovation was uh, also thrilled about this, but they both looked at me and said, mm, we have to go through this through the Minister of Finance. <laughs> and they, they see that as a huge problem. Um, so this this needs obviously to be discussed further. What, what should the balance be, and what should be the individual uh, responsibility and input? Um, uh, and from the employer side, it's it's also important to have, to have the discussion where the uh, the studies are carried out for the benefit benefit of both the employer and individual or if it is for the individual only. There has to be an alignment, of course. If you want your company to pay for your education, you might need to understand that it should be in line with what the company needs and not find something you would want to do for your next career, perhaps. Um, but um, the fact that the compensation should be of such amount that it doesn't deter the individual from taking the step to be in studying must also, must also be taken into account. Otherwise, you will never get anyone to study. So um, I know we are a bit late, so I'm not going to, uh, to uh, keep going longer than this. But this is basically what we came up to uh, together. And the fine things about this is it's nothing really profoundly new in here. We uh, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for any for the system to adapt. I told you in the start that we love our systems and we don't want to change them a lot. So so sort of tweaking them a bit is usually the way to go. So that is why this it's not really revolutionary, but we wanted to um, to start with what we have and just tweak it a bit to get it going and also show the potential that our system actually has and that it is not needed a lot to change it and to get going because we have been talking enough. It's time to, to take action. So thank you for your time. Thank you Ulrika and to all of our speakers. I'm sure you all have a lot of questions for our speakers and I hope they'll oblige those questions over uh, to your coffee. I'm afraid we will need to move straight to to your coffee. Uh, which be served in Cafe Clyde here. Um, if you could please have that to your coffee relatively quickly and come come back to us here by uh, 11.40 in 20 minutes time. So thank you. The, the title of this session is Engineering Skills of the Future, a Research Showcase. So this is essentially going to be a quick fire round of four of what I think are fascinating uh, EU funded projects relating to uh, research and engineering education spanning three Irish universities but taking in many uh, dozen uh, international partners across uh, industry and academia. So there will be four presentations, each uh, 12 minutes long, and just let the speakers know I'll tap on the glass when you've, when you've one speaker left, oh, sorry, you've one minute left. I'll then ask each the ask the four speakers to uh, come up to join me on the stage and we'll have a short Q&A and then break for lunch around a quarter to one. 
So the first of the four presentations is by uh, Kelvin Martins. Kelvin is a researcher at the School of Mechanical Manufacturing Engineering at Dublin City University. There he works with Dr. Anne Morrissey and Dr. James Carton, who are projects on an EU-funded Erasmus project called Creative Engine. This project aims to boost the capacity of engineering companies for creativity and innovation for both social and economic reasons. So thank you, Kelvin. Yeah. Um, good morning. Is it still morning? Yes. <laughs> good morning. No lunch yet. Um, so uh, my name is Kelvin Martins. Um, uh, like he said, I work in, in Dublin City University. Um, I here, I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Anne Morrissey and Dr. James Carton. Um, and I'm going to be here talking to you uh, briefly about the Creative Engine project which uh, has been going on for around a year now and it's still ongoing it is quite a long-term project um, it's essentially a partnership between four countries and five colleges and universities across these countries uh, and it's a eu uh, it's an erasmus project it's, so it's eu uh, funded um, and it's it, the main goal here is to introduce and develop in engineers and in engineering education um, some skills that aren't usually developed uh, and these skills are creativity and innovation so I'm just gonna introduce here the project uh, briefly so like I said we have four countries um, there's Ireland ourselves with at Dublin City University uh, then there's the UK with two partners there's Ike the Institute for, uh, for Innovation and Knowledge Exchange in, in, in England and there's Southwest College in, in Northern Ireland. And then there's the Thomas More Institute in Belgium, and there's Technica in Spain. So those are the partners. And we got together to promote then the vital skills of creativity and innovation into engineering education. So the premise, the reason for the project is the fact that engineering education typically, classically, focus, uh, focuses on technical spe uh, specification and exact uh, sciences and doesn't leave much space to those vital skills that are growing and being more and more important. Um, and I, I, th I think this fits well with what was said before the break by previous, uh, uh, in previous presentations that we need um, to not move away but uh, introduce uh, new skills more human skills into engineers together with the skills, the technical skills that, or, that they already have. Uh, so just uh, a defining moment here, just a, a brief definitions of creativity and innovation just to make things, uh, uh, things perfectly clear. Oh, that's a bit, um, yeah. Uh, so creativity is the ability of create, invent and imagine something new. So creativity is a state of mind it is a constant an active process of being able to think um, outside the box and create something new something that didn't exist before that's being creative and innovation then being innovative is when um, those ideas those creations uh, become something uh, tangible so they become a service a project a business model etc uh, so Innovation is value creation, is when you, you are creative and that leads to um, added value, value creation, that's innovation. So they, they go hand in hand, of course, they are, they, they, they go together, creativity and innovation. So um, the aim then of, uh, of this project is to then understand what's missing. So I'm going to talk about how we did that in a minute. So understand the skills that are missing in, in modern engineering education and industry. And then develop materials, so pedagogical materials uh, for students and for teacher training. And then uh, modules, uh, online content, uh, podcasts, uh, case studies, etc. Uh, and then making uh, those materials available to anyone who's interested. So those materials will be open source, so they will be available for, for, for anyone who's interested. Um, and so if you are interested, so Anne and James will circulate now a sheet, a signing sheet, 
So if you're interested or not, uh, could, could you please sign your name and surname and your email address and you can tick the box if you are interested or not and then we can contact you uh, eventually when these materials are ready and available. So that should be next year, early next year. Um, so this is so, so this is the phase of the project where we are now so developing these uh, innovative materials uh, to ensure that uh, engineering learners, engineering students have knowledge and abilities uh, that can boost their employability opportunities so, 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 they, so they can be ready to what's out there for the market. Uh, entrepreneurial capabilities and the ability to become leaders, so either uh, leaders of themselves or, or leaders of teams. So this is the stage where we are now, material development, again these materials are going to be available to everyone. Um, and the stage where we were before, uh, so how we understood those needs, um, that was um, made through a survey. So we surveyed several engineering companies um, earlier this year, so during the spring, so in February and March, we conducted a survey. It was quite extensive, actually. So in in the in, across the four countries and the five partners, we got. 240 companies to participate, so 240 companies across the four countries. And here in Ireland, we got 49 engineering companies across the whole country as well. So not just uh, the main hubs, not just Dublin, but uh, uh, 20 counties uh, across the country. So that was pretty representative as well because of company sizes, as you can see. So gray, there, I don't know if you can see it properly, but gray represents small companies, less than 50 employees. Uh, orange is medium, so 50 to 250, and blue is large, so more than 250 employees. So there's a pretty good mix of company sizes there, pretty good uh, mix of uh, geography there with different counties and different countries. Um, and uh, people who took that this survey were people usually in, deeply involved with innovation. Uh, CEOs, uh, man, uh, innovation managers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a pretty good representation of what the country thinks and what the industry thinks that it needs. So I'm going to present a few results here. Uh, uh, you can see leaflets that we we gave around for you. Uh, so there's more information here, um, and there's more information about the partners and contact information for, for all of them. So please, if you don't have one, uh, I'll give you. We'll give you one in a minute as well. Uh, so you're free to take these, uh, but I'm going to present some results here anyway. Um, some of the results, not all. The, the survey was wasn't very long, but it got uh, we got 24, 25 questions. I'm going to present the main ones, so the ones that are more um, interesting and uh, relevant. So first of all, there's uh, this is a result for Ireland. 83% of companies admit that their approach to innovation is not structured. So we have that um, a pretty um, impressive amount of companies admitting. So again, we're not we're not inferring anything. We're not we're not judging. We're, uh, this this is their own perce perception. So this is their own uh, judgment of themselves. So they admit that their approach to innovation isn't structured. So comparing to an EU result of 75%, so uh, pretty similar. So if value is to be um, derived from innovation, uh, it needs to. We need some structure. We need some form of organization. So if there's no, if there's no organization, if there's no um, structure, uh, is it truly innovation? So is is it worth having? So just a reflection there uh, on those percentages. Um, another. Interesting one, in Ireland, two in five companies, so 40% of companies admit that the engineering departments don't interact with customers directly, so they don't really sense what customers want, what customers need, so uh, how can you meet those needs and wants if you don't talk to them? So pretty interesting that the need to develop communication skills there. And the interesting thing is the EU results is even worse. So we have, instead of 40%, we have 54% admitting. So more than half of companies admitting that their engineering departments do not talk to customers. So that's pretty impressive. Um, just com comparing here Ireland with the EU, um, Ireland's going to be a bit better for some results, a bit worse for some results. 
but this is just so we have a sense that this is not an Irish issue. Um, it's it's a whole, it's an European issue, it's a world issue, of course. Uh, so this is just so you know, um, overall results are pretty in line with EU results as well. Uh, when it comes to building a business case for a new solution, for a new project, um, so how do companies see that? Uh, do, are they using systematic business planning techniques? So only one-third, less than one-third at the mid uh, say that they are. So over two-thirds are not really consistently using uh, systematic techniques for such an important step in any project or in any uh, innovation process that you may have. So again, another interesting result there. Uh, EU results again in line with Ireland. Uh, and the last one here, and perhaps uh, the one that gives us the whole reason for the project, eight in nine organizations in Ireland so considered that their creativity and innovation training needs are not being fulfilled. So we have almost 90% of the companies admitting uh, that they need more uh, when it comes to tr uh, creativity and innovation training. So this gives us the whole the, the whole picture. This gives, gives us the whole reason for why the, the this project is so important. And again, so 90% for Ireland, 80% for the EU, so pretty similar results as well. Um, and then as the next steps, uh, we're going to use these results, results like, like those and the other 20 that we have um, to promote and to achieve these intellectual outputs here. So applying innovation to support the uh, effective planning and the development of innovation itself, uh, aligning innovation and business strategies, uh, using metrics, so quantifying uh, as well as qualifying when it comes to developing uh, your company and growing your company, uh, developing skills that everyone needs, not just, not just engineers, but people in general uh, can be quite, can, uh, can be quite um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Can lack those skills of communication, analytical skills, problem solving, interpersonal skills, uh, like we saw the, the the issue of communicating with clients and customers. So all these are intertwined and they are a part of our intellectual outputs. So if you want more information, like I said, there's leaflet uh, contact information for all partners. Uh, these are here are us and James and myself. There's the Creative Engine website there, creative-engine.org. Uh, um, and thank you, and uh, we'll have questions um, after the board presentation then. Hey, thank you, Kelvin. Our next speaker is Darren Carthy. Darren is a, studying towards a PhD at the Technological University Dublin that's, uh, in the field of engineering education. Darren is specifically looking at the skills requirements for the success of early career engineers in industry. He is employed as a researcher on the European projects, professional roles and employability of future engineers prefer. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, just about. Um, so I work as part of a, a European project and as part of that project we have very strict guidelines on um, on proving that we were here and that we were presenting. So uh, my colleague Una is now handing out a, a, an attendance sheet and if you could sign that that would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm working as part of the PREFER project, which is the Professional Roles in Future Employability of Engineers. Um, it's a Knowledge Alliance project, which was funded by the EU under Strategic Action 2, which is Knowledge Alliances. Um, and the goal of that project was to reduce the skills mismatch in the field of engineering. So we've heard an awful lot today um, about skills and the types of skills that engineers require to really thrive in the labour market. Um, so. We also heard from Ulrika that um, there are a number of challenges when we when we try and uh, develop these competences at an individual uh, level, at a university level, and at a company level. So we've joined a consortium of other universities uh, with uh, industry stakeholders and also our colleagues in Engineers Ireland and some other accreditation uh, uh, boards across Europe. 
We've also partnered with BDO, who are a human capital company, who I'll speak about later, and of course with Safi, uh, which I am a proud member of, and also with Fianna. So just to give a little bit of background as to why why we should care about uh, skills and skills mismatch, uh, particularly in, in an Irish context, um, the EU carry a number of uh, significant statistics about how Ireland performs in terms of skill development skills and skills uh, mismatch. Um, and actually, we don't compare very favorably to the rest of the EU. Uh, we rank um, last at the moment in terms of skills mismatch. Skills mismatch is a country's ability to match relevant skills to the job. And engineers actually suffer, engineers and researchers suffer quite quite poorly in this regard. Um, and there's been no major changes in that statistic in about four years, which is pretty concerning. Um, so here's a, a chart of where Ireland ranks. Ireland is the light blue on the very bottom there. Um, now that's the overall indicator, so you can see it's not so bad, but in terms of mismatch it is. We are 28 out of 28. Um, so that's why I'm here, I, I guess. Um, so what did we do? Well, first we said, well, at a student level, when students go into industry, it's very difficult for them to frame the jobs that they're applying for in terms of the skills that they have. Um, they're usually framed in terms of discipline and the types of discipline that you apply for rather than the engineering functions, the actual things you're going to be doing. So we came up with this model, or at least we adapted it from what's called the Tracy Worsema model, which some people in business strategy may be familiar with. Um, so it breaks uh, all these jobs up into three distinct roles. Product leadership, which is about radical innovation in the field. Operational excellence, which is about taking those ideas and making them efficient in terms of cost and in terms of time. And customer intimacy, which is about finding tailored solutions for clients. And the way I see this model is, is more of a synergetic process whereby you, you start with the client. Uh, so you move the client to the center of the conversation because uh, without a client you don't really have much of a business. Then you need to develop a product and then you need to find a way to make that product viable um, and to produce that product at an effective cost. So we brought this to industry and we said, does this look like uh, a reflection of reality? And in small companies, it was fairly recognizable with some people who said this is not recognizable at all. Um, the same was true of medium-sized companies. Um, and in large companies, it was, a, it was more recognizable. And we, we, we think the reason for that is because in large companies, those roles are much more uh, separable. Because you have big companies, you can employ specialists, and you can work in distinct roles. Well, as in small companies, you could have one person doing all three of those jobs. Um, so then what we said was, well, we said, well, what kind of role do our students actually want to do when they leave college? And so we asked first years coming in the door, we said, well, what do you think you want to do? Can anybody guess what the predominant role was? Design, product leadership. Everybody wants to work with tangible things. Okay. So what we found was, this is a box and whisker plot, which I'm sure many of our engineers are familiar with. We asked uh, students in TU Dublin and in KU Leva, we said, well, what role would you rather do? And this was done with a vocational interest assessment. So this is really assessing what are you motivated to do? What are you demotivated to do? And you can see that by and large, um, most people are quite demotivated to work with clients. And most people are highly motivated to work with products. Which I, it's not surprising, is it? Um, it's not a surprising thing to find. Um, so, uh, we furthered our role model and we said, well, what skills do you think you need to work in each of those roles? If you accept that they're separate, um, what are the skills that you need? So we brought it to industry. We carried out 13 expert panels with industry. And these are the companies that we asked. So you can see there are some fairly major players in here, um, including some of our own partners um, on the project. And we said, can you assign some skills, some key skills that you think are important for each of these roles? And they said, no problem. Here you go. They didn't say no problem. <laughs> they, were, they were a bit like the hungry caterpillar. They wanted everything. When we gave them the list, there was a list of skills and ways that we can measure those skills. So in terms of demonstrable behavior. Um, and that's important because we can come up with these lists and tell you they're important. But how do we go and assess whether those skills exist and whether they are measurable quantities in our students? So this is our list. As you can see, there is some overlap. And I'd like to point out 
we do take the technical skills for granted, but I'd like to point out, I like to think of the middle of this as the technical skills. Um, everybody needs the technical skills to be an effective engineer, but then what differentiates you in each of these roles? So we can see, and uh, um, to echo some of the things I've already heard today, communication skills, networking, innovation, creativity, all pivotal, all pivotal skills that are required to be a successful engineer. So then we said, well, how do we go about trying to find out whether our students actually have these skills or not? So we consulted BDO. We said we want a test that will give us an idea of how well our students fit into each one of these roles. And the way we operationalize that is with the situational judgment test, which anyone in human capital is probably familiar with. A situational judgment test presents a situation with four behavioral responses, and the student has to indicate why particular responses are appropriate or inappropriate, and they're all operationalized around real engineering scenarios. So we called the test prefer match. Uh, we evaluated it again with 11 experts, uh, 11 panels of experts in industry. We piloted it with about 300 students, master students uh, in KU Leuva and in TU Dublin. Uh, and it was to the, trying to find out what role suits you best based on your judgment of these scenarios. So in total, we asked 53 industry experts across three countries to help us evaluate this test. These are the companies that were involved, and I'd like to thank them very much for their time. So now I'd like to show you some of the results of this test. Um, so we administered it to about, two, about 300 students. And what we found was is that in the product leadership role part of the test, um, we found that really students struggle to have a clear vision of the product, um, and they also struggle um, they also struggle to focus on the client's needs. Um, now, as my colleagues in DCU might point out, they might say, "How did you measure creativity and innovation, and why is it so high in our student population?" The reason the reason for that is because it's very difficult to measure innovation and creativity in a closed format. Um, so we operationalized it around a willingness to accept new ideas. So it was it was it was rather easy for them to score. So we make no presumptions about actually measuring real creative creativity, but rather. These tests are very good predictors of future behavior. So in other words, if you take somebody who has a very high score in client focus and who has a clear vision of a product, the likelihood is, is that they will have those traits when you go and, and they have to demonstrate them in industry. In operational excellence, we found that um, by and large, having a positive critical attitude was an issue for students, demonstrating that as a, as a behavior was very difficult for them and organizing the work in an efficient manner. That was also quite difficult for them. And then in the customer intimacy role, networking. So we've heard this a few times today, actually from Mike and Kevin, who both pointed out that networking is a, a really crucial skill for our engineers to have. Um, and clear communication, which again has been pointed out as being a really critical uh, skill to have. So I think we've highlighted here that there are certainly some skill deficiencies, or at least there are deficiencies in, uh, in the population um, results here for our master students. These are people that we're putting into industry. Um, so there's definitely some room for improvement to optimize them for industry. So just to summarize, I think this is important, especially um, if we consider 33% of our engineers and researchers are employed in professional services, and a, a, an overwhelming majority of them want to work in manufacturing and product development. So I think there is a little bit of expectation management, or at least reality checking to be done with our engineering students to let them know that engineers aren't just product developers, they work with clients and they work in operations trying to make things more efficient. Um, and I think we've also identified a number of key skill areas that we could develop interventions around and try and improve these traits in our students before we put them into industry to really give them the best chance to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Our third speaker in this session is Professor Aoife Ahern. Aoife is the college principal for the, the College of Engineering and Architecture at University College Dublin and a professor in civil engineering. She is interested in how critical thinking is taught at third level and she is a partner on the European project Critical Thinking in Engineering Education. Thank you.
So, uh, good afternoon. Um, as Richard was saying, my name is Eve Farhard, and I'm going to talk to you today about a project that's just finishing up, which is called Crit Think Edu. Um, and it's not just critical thinking in engineering education, it's actually critical thinking across a number of different disciplines. And my co authors from UCD on this project were Dr. John O'Sullivan and Dr. Karen McNally, both from the School of Civil Engineering as well. So, what I'm going to cover in my 12 minutes, and I will speak fast if I have to, is the, an introduction to what the project was about, who our partners were, the objectives of what we tried to do, talk to you a little bit about one element of the project, because there isn't really sufficient time to talk about all parts of the project, and then maybe finish up with some conclusions on what engineering and critical thinking are and how they interact together. Um, because I think there were some surprising findings about the lack of understanding of critical thinking in, in engineering as compared to maybe some other disciplines um, and other areas. So I know we've been praising ourselves quite a lot today in our different talks, and, and that's fantastic, but I think it's also good for us as engineers to realize when there are things that we are doing that aren't quite right and where we might learn from other disciplines. So this was an Erasmus-funded project which ran from 2016 to 2019. The final report was submitted yesterday, so very much just a, a project that's just finished. And what the objective of this project was was to look at critical thinking across a number of disciplines, how it's taught, how it's realized, how it's defined, and we have quite a large number of partners, as you can see from this as well, covering a wide range of countries. So the coordination was our par partner in Portugal, but we have partners in, in, New, in Spain, uh, Greece, um, Ireland, obviously, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, and Romania um, as well. And um, KU Leuven, who have been mentioned quite a few times in this project, were very much involved, uh, uh, this morning, have been very much involved in this project um, and are very, uh, very expert in this whole area of critical thinking. Now, all of those universities, they were not engineering departments. What we also covered in this project, slightly different from the other projects we've heard about today, was we were talking about discipline, a wide range of disciplines. So we in UCD were representing the engineering part along with partners in Portugal, but we also had partners who were from science background, medicine, veterinary medicine, economics, nursing, teaching, both secondary and primary school training, philosophy and psychology. So you can see quite a diverse range of disciplines there already and very interesting when we start to look at how they think about critical thinking and, and how, how far on they are in their discussions and debates about critical thinking. The objectives of the project were to first of all find out how critical thinking is being addressed across the European higher education institutes in different disciplines, explore how different stakeholders, both employers, academics, etc., value and define critical thinking. And as a result of that, create a network of critical thinking experts, which is what has happened at the, as a, at the end of this project and um, with a critical thinking day that took place in Leuven earlier on in this year, back in May. We also looked at creating recommendations and strategies to help in critical thinking and teaching, including some workshops and training schools. And we ran one of those workshops here in Engineers Ireland earlier on this year. But also all of those strategies, those tools, those training tools, are actually available on the Critical Thinking Edu website as well, where you can download handbooks on what critical thinking is and some of the reports from the project as well. So why we wanted to look at this is because I think as educators, most of us at some point in a learning objective or in a program learning objective state that our graduates will be critical thinkers. Um, probably every single university represented here today has that written somewhere. Our graduates will be critical thinkers. But none of us actually clearly define what we mean by that. What, what is a critical thinker? How do I know that my UCD engineer coming out at the end of five years is a critical thinker? And the, probably the real honest answer is that I don't know. I haven't measured it in any way. I haven't assessed it in any way. I haven't built it in properly into my programs to say, this is what critical thinking is. This is how I'm going to check that you have it. And this is how I'm going to grade you on critical thinking. Because I'm not really probably sure myself what critical thinking really is. There's a lot of definitions for critical thinking. When you start to look into the educational pedagogy and educational research, they can't always agree on what critical thinking is. So within this project, you've taken one definition. Because you have to start somewhere and decide that you're going to agree at least on one definition at the start. And so the definition we've taken is a very well-known definition of critical thinking by an expert, a US expert called Fazioni based on research that he did of a Delphi study of a number of experts in the area of education and critical thinking. And what he came up with is that critical thinking can be defined by a number of skills that we need to have in our students or in our engineers. And those skills are skills of interpretation, analysis, evaluation, inference, 
Explanation and self-regulation, an interesting one because maybe not one that we think about ourselves. The critical thinker needs to be able to regulate themselves, look at the work they've done, check what they've done as well. A lot of us as engineers would probably agree with this part and understand this part and understand the skills part. The bit that engineers that we might find a little bit more difficult is that Bassioni also states that actually critical thinking isn't just about skills, it's about an approach to life and approach to learning. So the real critical thinker must also have a certain number of dispositions. And those dispositions are being inquisitive, open-minded, judicious, truth-seeking, analytical, systematic, and confident in reasoning. And that's the bit that when I, I talk to you about what our employer said, that they struggled with, that they had some difficulties with in terms of dispositions. So across Europe, we carried out 32 focus groups with professionals across the different disciplines that I mentioned, so 189 specials. In engineering, we looked at both in Ireland and Portugal. In Ireland, we did three focus groups. So we concentrated on, it was the civil engineering group that we looked at in, in UCD. We looked at um, a focus group with consulting engineers, so um, designers, etc., contractors, and engineers working in the public sector. So three different focus groups, and there were some slight differences, slight differences between them in terms of that, for example, the public sector engineers tended to put a higher level of, um, uh, of stress on competencies and technical skills, whereas the private sector engineers put a higher level of emphasis on communication and transferable skills, actually stating to us that they preferred the, the graduate with a 2-2, who was good at communicating, than the graduate with a first class honours degree, who might have some issues with communicating. But quite different in the public sector who prefer your first class honours degree, even if they're not good at communicating. I'm not quite sure what that says about our public sector. <laughs> but anyway, when we look at our focus group, what we found in engineering is when we ask critical employers, what is critical thinking and is it important? Yes, it's absolutely important, but I don't actually know what it is. But I know it when I see it. I know what my, my, my employer still is if they're a critical thinker. Okay, so let's ta talk to us about what they should be able to do. And that's when it starts to get a bit easier. That they, They're not quite sure what critical thinking is, but they do have an idea of what they want that person to be. And they want them to be the kind of person who doesn't rely on the black box, who understands why a solution has come out a particular way, who can go back into models, etc., and analyze their analysis. Because there probably is an over-reliance among a lot of our students nowadays on the black box solutions, on models, on different software packages that they can put something into and get a result. So I hope you had a nice lunch and welcome back to, um, to our conference on engineering education. So the title of this session is Engineering Education, Accreditation Standards and Mobility. Just to let you know that we have a slight change to the agenda, we'd like to pass on the apologies of um, Alan Spillan from LIT who couldn't be with us today. Um, so a slight rejig to the agenda is that Damien Owens will speak first, followed by Maria Kine. And then I'll bring myself in for quite a short presentation. Just in that presentation, I'll set up the workshops which will follow and give you a little bit more information on uh, our program outcomes and our accreditation criteria. So I'll just introduce uh, Damien Owens, my colleague. But Damien is president of the European Network for the Accreditation of Engineering Education, NA. He's also chair of the governing group of the International Engineering Alliance. He's also Registrar here at Engineers Ireland, where he's responsible for the accreditation of third level programmes. Damien is a Chartered Engineer and a Fellow of Engineers Ireland, having worked in telecommunications for, for 20 years. Thanks Richard. Richard has the honour round not to go beyond 15 minutes, so I'll try my best. I also recognise you've had a lunch and uh, the rest, so I'll try and keep you awake and not, not send you to sleep talking about accreditation criteria. Um, I suppose really what I want to do for the next 15 minutes is just give you a, a quick overview of some of the international trends and, and what, it, what actually influences our accreditation criteria and where did they actually come from? Um, so as I was looking at an engineering topic, I decided to start with a good engineering slide. Um, my background is in civil engineering, but we, we look at this one anyway. This is the Arthur Ashe Stadium in New York. Um, it's the largest tennis uh, stadium in the world, 23,000 people, all huddled around a very small tennis court. So a fair feat of engineering to get to get the seats at that slope. Not long after they built it, they realized that it, the, the, the US, otherwise known as Flushing Meadows, people may remember from that name, 
uh, the, the US tennis open was cancelled three years in a row or suspended because of rain so they decided to roof it and uh, so the the US Lawn Tennis Association engaged with every architectural firm in North America not engineers, architectural firm in North America that made roofs on stadia and he put a four and a half thousand ton roof on the top so it's a, a great piece of engineering a different view of it is here in August of this year many people have played the game Fortnite many of you have heard of the game Fortnite Okay, Fortnite is a very addictive game, apparently, and it started in March 2017. So, whereas the US Law and Tennis Association is probably about 100 years old, this crowd is two years old, and they filled the stadium for their World Cup finals. Well, that's roughly what it looks like. So, it got me thinking a bit when you do a bit of comparison. If you look at the US Tennis Open, you have 57 million in prize money. Fortnite had 30 million. After two years, that's not bad. Top prize was 3 million, which is more than Tiger Woods gets for winning uh, a competition. Higher than Wimbledon, higher than the Tour de France winner. Did 100 contestants. They were all under 16. Right? Average age was about 16. And they were all male. And really, if you look at that, you see, but the challenge there is how do we attract? that cohort, that generation, to do engineering, but how do we reach them, what skills do they need? If they walked into this room, would they be um, enamored, would they, would they be defined as, uh, would they be enthused by, by what, we're, what we have on offer? So we just, I lay that one out there for people to, to digest, I don't know if there's a, a right or a wrong answer, but it's just something I think that would make us think about the generations coming behind us. If we look at the global environment, um, earlier we touched on the, the United Nations Strategic Development Goals and how they are used or abused in, in world rankings for, for universities. Uh, there's lots of other factors coming into play. We have Generation Z, so, or the swipe generation. All they know to do is to, is, is to swipe screens. Uh, lots of other effects. Global warming, which is interesting. I was reading an article the other day that the scientific sort of view in the 50s was that the earth was cooling uh, because you had a few cold winters. So it's amazing how, how views can change. Uh, we, have, we have artificial intelligence, even trade flows. They all have an impact on, on the environment and the, the mobility of, uh, of engineers. I suppose the focus of, of organizations like the International Engineering Alliance and NA is building engineering capacity. So at one level, it's looking at accreditation criteria and the thresholds that we impart onto our students and future engineering workers, but also to de deliver the capacity within academic institutions and professional engineering bodies on a global basis to deliver engineering talent. Because as we heard earlier, quite a number of the engineers that we have being recruited in Ireland are coming from overseas. So it's not just a domestic issue. We have to look at generating capacity on a global basis of, of engineering talent. And even whether that, whether that capacity moves, or not physically, it still has to, it still can work in other jurisdictions. So, for example, you can have a Spanish engineer can be designing a, a house in Dublin from Madrid and off. You don't even have a foot in the country. So, it is a, a global profession. So, capacity building is, is a key part of it. Looking ahead, um, we, we, we can see what's coming down, literally coming down the road with autonomous vehicles and the one there I've thrown in there to be provocative is autonomous armies. There's an organization called Andril, A-U-N-D-R-I-L, um, who has developed a drone to take out drones. So basically it will come up beside a, a drone that's causing a problem and crash into it and cause it to, to crash. They have denied, um, even though they've got contracts with the US Department of Defense, they've denied that they, they would be they would see autonomous warfare as one of the areas they would be involved in or anything. But it does not take a large leap in our consciousness to realize that, you know, these things could indeed happen, whether they be used by so those government organizations or terrorists you know so we have to ed educate our engineers the whole ethical responsibility of of to look at the impact of the technologies they are developing a lot don't forget a lot of the issues in global warming we are looking at perhaps have been caused by engineers taking oil out of the ground and developing cars and generations to burn that oil and and, and send it into the atmosphere so we need to look ahead and make sure we're not generating um tomorrow's work today so to speak
So there's another area that comes out of, of the UN SDGs is, uh, is the one of engineering influence at a policy and a global basis. And perhaps it's time we should really look we, to have more engineers in government and in positions that can influence um, some of the of the, the strategies we need uh, uh, as a nation. If you look at the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, is an engineer from Portugal. So um, maybe we need more engineers in, in those in those positions. So we do need a different skill set. I suppose while technology is becoming more advanced at a consumer level, perhaps its use of it is becoming perhaps dumber. Um, we've all grown used to sat-nav, which has made us lazier in other ways, um, and the sat-nav isn't always right, as you well know. Um, back in the day, we used to search Google, now Google searches us. So it has our information, um, and again, there's a whole ethical debate around what goes on with that information. So really our challenge is, is how do we educate engineers to be adaptive and remain relevant for the many careers they will have? Because, you know, they will have many careers. So where do our learning outcomes and our accreditation criteria come from? Um, well, it wasn't Moses, but uh, I suppose the way to look at it is there are about 30,000, I estimate about 30,000 um, colleges out there teaching engineering around the world. And they pretty much all use the same textbooks. They use the same Bernoulli's equation, the same Kirchhoff's laws and all the rest. So how do we distinguish between them? And Really, where accreditation comes in is looking at the quality assurance, the standards, and the thresholds of what students have learned. So, all of you in this room would probably be familiar with this book. It, it insti instills delight and fear in equal measure into many faces. It's our accreditation criteria. Uh, Richard will talk in more detail about these later, but just to show you the influences of where, what drives some of the input in these documents. So, that was our 2014 edition. Uh, we're working on a 2019 edition. Uh, and that's part of this workshop is to gather your inputs as academics and practitioners to feed into the next iteration of these criteria to make engineering education and the engineers relevant for the next uh, number of years. So we've seven, seven outcomes, A to G, fundamentally A through D uh, would be the core, what we would call the hard engineering topics, the maths, the science, design, investigation, and then E, F, and G used to be called the soft skills, but what we really call necessary skills. And uh, these are become the real differentiators as we move forward. Um, there's three levels, technician level, associate engineer level, and chartered engineer level. And there's various descriptors in there which des de define uh, and set out other requirements, such as the facilities that need to be in place, uh, entry criteria, etc. It's outcome based. So for those who aren't familiar, we go on site, we look at evidence, see what students have learned. So it's not just enough to say you do 10 hours of math and 4 hours of physics or whatever. It is outcome based. We look at what the, the work of the students um, and interview them and interview employers to get a 360 degree feedback of what's going on. And we re review um, universities and institutes of technology every five years. Look at a slightly different variant, uh, d different aspect. Um, Engineers Ireland was found a member of an A, which produces the URACE framework standards. They too have eight um, program areas. Again, similar in in, in title to to our own. They deal with two levels, a bachelor's and a master's level. Again, it's evidence based and it's a five year cycle. And they comprise of twenty members, mostly from the European higher education uh, area. The International Engineering Alliance, though, on your hand, um, produce a set of graduate attributes. So the IEA would be, I suppose, more colloquially known as the Washington Accord, and they started life in 1989. And they have a number of accords at three levels, uh, a professional level, uh, which is a, would be a chartered engineer, a technologist, and technician level, each set out in accord. And again, they have an evidence-based system where there's a review taken at site with a six-year review cycle, and you have about 40 global members. So these, these guidelines, these graduate attributes, have basically been drafted by 40 different jurisdictions uh, representing both academic and um, industry um, um, practitioners. 
So if you look at the, the Washington Corridor in a little bit more detail, or the IA ones, you'll see in the left hand the left hand column from where you're looking at it, the, the, the graduate attributes is defined there. And as you go across from left to right, it'll start off the Washington Accord, moving towards Dublin Accord, and you see that the level of knowledge and the level of um, detail it, under each column will change. So the Washington Accord would be the most demanding. So you're looking there in problem analysis, you're looking at the, the, the complexity there is um, formulate research literature, analyze complex engineering problems. Whereas we go to the right of that, for the Sydney Accord graduates, it's broadly defined engineering problems. And if you go to the right of it again for Dublin Accord graduates, it's well defined problems. So we're setting out the level of knowledge that each, uh, a, a, a graduate in each of those levels of programs sort of would, would have. And there are 12 graduate attributes. And they cover, again, the standard engineering knowledge, problem, um, problem complexity, design and development. But also, as we go further down, is the role of engineer in society, where the engineer fits in, um, environmental and sustainability uh, issues, communication, because engineers typically have not been the best of communicators, and they must communicate in particular with non-engineering organizations or uh, people, uh, non-organization, uh, non-engineering organizations and people. So be that the HR director or the finance director to get their, their viewpoint across. I suppose other ones that come in now in, in recent years is project management and finance. That doesn't mean the engineer has to be an accountant, but he certainly need to know if they're adding in components, the cost impact of that. And if they're taking out components, the cost impact of that. So if you looked at the, I don't know, the Boeing 737, you know, that's going on one sensor, built on one sensor, you can get a second one in. Was that an engineering or a commercial decision? Um, and, and how did that decision come about? And that may come out over time as the investigations go on. Again, we have QQI have their award standards frameworks, uh, and they look at a number of levels. Here, I've just put levels six, seven, eight, and nine. They look at knowledge, breadth, kind, know-how, skill, and range, uh, and know-how, skill, and selectivity. So they have a fairly broad, you won't be able to read that, but basically their framework then looks across a whole range of levels, and the, the level of, of knowledge and depth of knowledge required at each, at each of those. There are many other organizations. So there's the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, European Quality Assurance for Higher Education, Education, the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies, which incorporates about 300 members into their organizations. And they all feed into this, I suppose, large um, body of knowledge that ultimately ends up being distilled into our accreditation criteria. And there's many organizations that I've even mentioned here that were we mentioned throughout today, like FIANI, um, the European Engineers Advisory Group. There's lots of other inputs that ultimately feed in here uh, and end up in our accreditation criteria, which then end up uh, being awarded as an, uh, to, to, to an accredited engineering program. So really, the role of Engineers Ireland is, I suppose, to gather and represent the input from all sectors, academic, um, and, and practitioners, the setting and maintenance of the accreditation standards, and in the reverse direction, for us to take, you know, what we learn here and feed that back into the international community and try and influence international standards and represent best practice. So it's, I suppose, it's a complex, it's a complex web of uh, quality assurance uh, interactions between industry, between academia, between students. Uh, and it's a balancing act of getting all that together uh, so that it represents best practice that we deliver engineering talent that has the engineering know-how, but also, I suppose, the, the, the other skills to impart that knowledge in a responsible and ethical manner uh, for society at large. So I'm going to hand over now to the next speaker, who's Richard. Richard, are you next? Mm -hmm. no, Maria, sorry. Maria. Thank you, Damien. Our next speaker is Maria Kine. Maria is the you know this, the Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science, Energy and Technology at Limerick Institute of Technology. She is a Chartered Engineer and a Fellow of Engineers Ireland. She previously worked as a Chartered Engineer for over 30 years. Maria is currently undertaking a PhD in the Accreditation of Engineering Education, which of course makes her research highly relevant to our work here today. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to present today my work for that I'm looking at uh, that's relevant to what we're talking about today, and it is my PhD uh, study. So, um, starting out with what is engineering education as defined by the International Engineering Alliance, the definition there of engineering education is that the fundamental purpose of engineering education is to build a knowledge base and attributes to enable the graduate to continue learning and to proceed to formative development that will develop the competencies required for independent practice. So when we're talking about quality of engineering education, it's measured by professional bodies using two methods normally, outcomes evidence-based criteria, such as Damien alluded to a minute ago, for evaluating education programs, and competency-based standards for professional recognition. So quality in, I'm talking particularly about the Institute of Technology sector, um, and that's now changing into the TU sector, we have uh, quality assurance for engineering education programs as over the last number of years has evolved into two types of assessment. Internal programmatic review, which tends to be a, a strategic review of faculties and departments and programs within departments, and they tend to be clumped together uh, and reviewed together. And then you have external accreditation, which is rigorous review of individual programs within the departments. Both methods differ in their focus and intent and the preparation required by the program teams and the management. So we have two processes emphasizing very different aspects of engineering education, but they're very similar. There's a lot of overlap and the workload required, is a, there's a lot of duplication of workload required for the two processes. Sorry, beg your pardon, I'll just go back one. My PhD research itself is exploring the possibility of the alignment of the programmatic review and the external accreditation processes for engineering education programs in Ireland. If we can do then that, then we can see is it possible to put that into one single collaborative process or can we have the two processes occurring within the sequentially within the same time frame. The PhD is supervised by uh, the Professor Merlin Goose, the professor, STEM professor in UL, at the University of Limerick, and uh, I have a second supervisor, Dr. Peter Tiernan, from UL as well. These processes are very policy driven, whether it's QQI, policy driven processes, you have policies within your own higher educational organization and you have policies from the International Engineering Alliance, from Engineers Ireland, and if you were doing the same for a different professional body, they would have their own policies and partnership agreements as well. So it's a very, they're very policy-driven processes, and that's just giving you an example of some of the policies that we have to look at. And then my research design then started out by looking at the, the gatekeepers, the people who control the policies, control the entrance into our profession and working with the higher educational institutions, the gatekeepers within our higher educational institutions, the gatekeepers of the processes. So there was a consult consultation phase with gatekeepers and initially I worked with the IOTI, which is now TIA, uh, Council of Heads of School of Engineering, and we created a draft position paper on is it possible, have we a desire, have we an ambition to um, create this quality assurance procedure or this coming together of the quality assurance procedures. And we consulted with the TIA, Core uh, Council of Registrars, with QQI and with the Registrar of Engineers Ireland. And from that point, we created a comparative table from which we, pi we were able to do a focus group and focus group pilot where we looked at the questions we need to be exploring in depth in the main phase of the research, which is the Delphi technique, rounds one, two, and three. The Delphi technique is used in research when you're trying to get insights from experts who have experience and trying to get the information uh, and learn from their experience and expertise. So there was three rounds. First round was semi-structured interviews. The second round was a when you feed back the information to them in the form of a structured questionnaire. 
and then you, there's a ter third round when you're trying to refine the outcomes of the research in a, also in semi-structured interviews. The consultation phase, um, we did the position, position paper, and then from that it, it emerged through the Council of Heads of School of Engineering that there is a desire and an ambition to bring the process into closer alignment, whatever that may look like, so that uh, we would be then in a position to achieve uh, the same outcomes because there is a lot of overlap uh, and duplication. Then we took it to the Council of Registrars and to the Registrar of Engineers Ireland, and who agreed in principle that this is a, a way forward that we'd like to explore. And then we I had a meeting with the QQI, which are a very important gatekeeper in terms of quality assurance in higher education, and to consider if it's possible to align the objectives. If we're going to bring two processes into closer alignment, you have to start with the objectives of each process. Can they be brought into closer alignment? So I prepared 24. I looked at the engineering award standards from QQI. The QQI professional award type descriptors and the Engineers Ireland accreditation criteria and I looked at those in more detail and when I did and I'll show you samples of that in a few minutes there was over 90% alignment between these standards and that is what has emerged so as well as aligning to that Damien has just demonstrated to the international uh, our international counterparts we also have to align to the QQI standards for engineering. So, and then we went on to look at a comparative analysis between the two processes to see where we could find similarities and uh, in the process, how much of the process were the same, how much was different. And we discovered there was about a 70, 30 percent. 70 percent of the process were more or less the same and may be called something different in the two processes but more or less doing the same work and there was about a 30 percent difference now in terms of the sample of the first sample there is trying to triangulate the engineering award standards the professional award type descriptors and the third column is the engineers iron accreditation criteria you're doing that under strands. For QQI, they have strands, which are knowledge, skills, and competencies. And then you have sub five substrands. But just looking at the strands, and I took a sample from each level, the Eng Tech level, which is NQF level six, under skills, you have it for knowledge, skills, and competencies, but I'm just taking the skills one, um, and what it says under each of them. And you have the level six program outcomes that relate directly to that. I've just made them put them in there in short form. I've written it out uh, properly in, in the analysis. But just to fit it on the slide, I put it in. These are the areas of the Engineers Ireland accreditation criteria that are practically the same. The same with the second sample, again with the strands for NQI level 7, which is the associate engineer, under, and I've taken the competency strand. And again, it gives you uh, it shows you how they link together. Again, for the third strand for the um, eight, levels eight and nine, uh, and I have an extra column there, one for level eight and one for level nine, and again for chartered engineer, and I've just taken the knowledge one in this case, and it shows you where they all link. So if you're looking at the substrands, and again, I just selected one of the substrands that will be easy to present here. So for the level six there, professional title um, uh, engineering technician, you under knowledge breadth, basic knowledge of management and business, aware of social and commercial context of engineering. They're not exactly the same, but they're more or less, the, the intent is the same between them. So even though the words, the verbiage is different, the intention or the learning that you're, the student is supposed to get is more or less the same, just maybe expressed in a slightly different way. I've taken another one for the, the design and development substrand for level seven, associate engineer. And again, you can see even though the words are different, the intent and this, what the learning is the same. 
And again, that follows through into the level eight and nine chartered as well. So even though uh, the wording is slightly different, the message here is that they're more or less very closely aligned. And if we're looking at it uh, overall, there's a 90% agreement between the QQI award standards and the Engineers Ireland accreditation criteria as it stands. That may change when we go to do the review, but that's where it stands at the moment. Now, just to be careful here, I've summarized some of those there to fit into the slide, so they're not exactly the same, but uh, it's uh, just a, a word of warning that is not exactly the same. I've brought it down so it fits exactly, into uh, fits onto the slide. And then we did the, the comparative analysis, and if you're looking at it, the um, the different process. The first one is the process stage. Then the the process activity just take the cyclical review period. Programmatic review is five to seven years. Normally, engineers are the accreditation is five years between each accreditation cycle. Say so mandatory or voluntary. The mandate programmatic review is mandatory for the institutes of technology, um, but it's voluntary, it's a voluntary process essentially, even though for engineering it's quasi-mandatory -mand in reality. So th we were able to do that comparative analysis and that led us to be able to produce uh, questions which we, d we carried out a focus group to complete. From there we started what I would call the in-depth research where we had semi-structured interviews with uh, predetermined multi-level expert group who have the experience and knowledge to um, be able to provide insights for this. And the outcomes from that fell into two categories. We identified, from that we identified 17 themes and 83 sub-themes or sub-questions within those themes for uh, areas we need to look at if we're going to put the two processes together into some sort of closer alignment. And I broke that into the, those 17 themes into two halves. The first half is where, where you're looking at existing processes, and the second half will be looking at revised process if you're looking at a different process. And that those are the two kind of sets of themes that emerged from round one. Then, we went, uh, then I went on to look at round two. We sent out a structured questionnaire uh, and where we're gathering the individual views, feeding back the information from round one in the form of questions um, that we got and getting the views of the participants on these 17 theme areas. And from that, we'll go on to do round three, which is further refining uh, the areas where there's significant difference. So just taking a sample from the round two uh, QA process overview team theme, you, as you can see there, uh, the questions, sub-questions are there on the left-hand side, programmatic review, part of the program cycle. Most people are in agreement with that and very a small percentage disagreed. Um, does the program hold up internationally? 95% agreed, zero disagreed. So you do why are you doing the process and what it's what is it about was the overview theme. So as you can see there was a lot of agreement in that scenario. I've taken another example which is probably more relevant and uh, pre pre presented it in the form of green means everyone agreed with it, orange means there's some mixed opinions and the uh, blue there is disagreed. Now, going from the left-hand side, is I had my my participant sample had registrars, professional body uh, experts, uh, heads of faculty, and I further def defined it into mechanical and electrical and civil engineering. So ME is mechanical and electrical. So heads of faculty who would be looking after mechanical and electrical programs, heads of department who would be looking after mechanical and electrical programs, and staff who would be looking after mechanical and electrical programs. And the same with on the civil side, the heads of faculty, heads of department, and staff on the civil side. So from that you can see most people were in agreement on the overview issues. If we go to look at something a little bit more uh, interesting, 
the uh, should we align or combine the programs? Um, and if you take out the one with 50% there and agree, most of them are fairly strong on agreeing that yes, we should. Now, the run simultaneous but separate, that should have been in a different one. But anyway, we'll come back to that in a minute. So presenting it here, taking out 10E, you fairly strong agreement among the part research participants that we should uh, align or combine the two processes. But then when you get to well, how are we going to do it? Method of alignment and combine, and you get into a completely different scenario. <laughs> so some of this, I went back and looked at the way I phrased the questions in the questionnaire. So some of the confusion may be around that. So that's the one I'll be concentrating on for phase three. But it gives you an indication of uh, the problems that we encountered. So as you can see, there's much less agreement here, and more disagreement and mixed views across all the groups here. So it just goes to show the method, how is still uh, an issue. So our outcomes from the round two so far is the round one findings have identified that the research participants are very supportive of the possibility of aligning, combining the process, but um, further exploration of these has shown that the method of alignment is still very contentious and it's still an area that needs further investigation. And we have other areas which have been identified where there are clear protocols need to be established. And the outcomes from round two, we had 83 sub-questions uh, within those 17 themes. Mostly agreed, 75% agreed overall with, within each question, and 11% 11, 11 disagreed, and 4% uh, were neither agreed or disagreed, so there might have been some confusion in the way I asked the question. So there's some unresolved themes. There's whether the engineers aren't accreditation process should be mandatory or voluntary. Uh, there's some strong views on that. The method of alignment or combination of the processes is still um, something we need to work on. The synchronizing of the review cycles, that, that's an area, how, the length of which should, you, should it be five years, should it be seven years, there, there, there's a, an issue there. The alignment of process objectives, how that can be done. Panel membership in terms of the competency, training and guidance of panel members for both the programmatic review and the engineers, is there a minimum standard we want to set? Um, or just guidance and training, online guidance or training, that, that's something we should seriously look at. Uh, independence of the process outcomes. If you, are you, should validation and accreditation be two very independent outcomes or should, if you get validated, should that automatically assume accreditation? Or is it, should there be two very independent outcomes? Sharing of responsibility, if you're bringing two processes that are managed completely separate now, how is that management and responsibility shared? And then managing liaison report generation and who signs off what report and when and how. So that's all part of further exploration into round three. So we have two major cumbersome quality assurance processes for engineering education. Uh, they're in place currently, which differ in focus and intent, but have considerable overlaps, which add a lot to the workload of the management and staff within the Institutes of Technology. There has been significant consultation has taken place with the gatekeepers, and the research is designed so that we're getting the insights from the experts and the people who have the experience in uh, of the programmatic review and the engineers are in the accreditation process and the research is in the data collection and analysis phase and hopefully we will have uh, final outcomes from that in the not too distant future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you Maria. We'll have a little bit of time at the end of this session for a few questions. So if I could um, abuse my position as chair and bring myself in very briefly, I suppose by means of introduction that 